Hey, everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. We're all cold now. It's kind of wintry. Uh, we're with Aaron Marshall from Intervals. Uh, Aaron's up in Canada. Great guitar player uh, and very good writer of music. And uh, I'm looking forward to talking with him. A uh, couple of quick announcements. I want to thank Adam Clark for reaching out and uh, connecting us. And make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to the show. And if you're watching us on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button and the little emoji that looks like a bell that helps us get recommended in YouTube. And thanks for the support. All right. Quickly on Aaron, born and raised just outside of Toronto, Canada, started playing guitar at age 12. You got an acoustic Takamini. He is the lead guitarist for the prog metal band. As I said, Intervals founded the band in 2011. He's released four albums and two EPs since then. And he's also toured the world playing festivals opening or headlining with bands like dirty loops pliny carnival animals as leaders nick johnson who we had on here was a lot of fun and others man thank you so much for your time i appreciate you coming on the show it's a nice little intro thanks for having me do appreciate it <laughs> you're welcome uh how did you first get you started playing guitar at 12 how did you first get started in the music business and maybe what was your first break or what was a good couple of breaks you had along the way hmm yeah so um I well, I wanted to be a drummer, so just throw a curveball on that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I definitely wanted to to play drums first, but uh, it uh, yeah didn't really didn't really line up living in a you know in a bungalow in you know Scarborough, Ontario. So uh, I think uh, it's funny because I did wind up with a drum kit in the house. But uh, at first, you know, I was expressing some interest in music, and um, I had an uncle, uh, my dad's brother, who played guitar, and uh, you know, we, uh, we would visit every once in a while and it was kind of like, yeah, maybe that's cool. And there was some other stuff, you know, some childhood experiences that maybe piqued my interest in music, but I think, uh, what it, what it really was, I remember my parents brought home their first, uh, DVD player kind of showing my age. Cause I said the first, oh, don't, dude, you're my kid's age, please. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So brought home, they brought home a DVD player. And, uh, I think they were like, so enamored with the fact that you could go to like future shop or HMV or whatever, like, um, which future shop became Best Buy in Canada. In Canada yeah. That was, that was the predecessor to the, to Best Buy. Um, and HMV is actually a British, uh, CD uh, retailer. I actually used to work at one at, at a local mall. Uh, it was one of my first jobs. Um, anyhow, so yeah, um, they, they they got these live concert DVDs, and they were so like my parents love music. They have great taste in music. Neither of them are musicians, but like I said, my dad's brother's a guitarist, and they have exceptional taste in music. Like the soundtrack to my childhood was filled with all the best stuff. So. Um, they uh yeah discovered live concerts on dvd which is like a really you know cool uh at the time was just like really interesting thing i mean you might have only seen like a little thing on tv every once in a while um so to have that in the comfort of your own home and with your first little surround sound system set up and everything at the time it was pretty exciting so they brought home uh supernatural uh live by carlos santana you've probably seen the one you yeah. maybe yeah great absolutely unbelievable uh performance and, and production and i don't know why that one made me feel like i wanted to play guitar and i will say like um because i've shared that story before that uh, while i respect santana and i think his music is amazing not as much of an influence of course but it was definitely like the way he played and his tone and the overall production and stuff and there's something about it at the time as a kid that made me just be like yeah, I think I want to try that. So my dad and I uh, went and we sort of, you know, we rounded up that you even said it in the intro. Um, we got a attack. I mean, from like a pawn shop, you know, secondhand and um, brought it home and I could barely get my arm around it. I was really small at the time and was really frustrated by not being able to figure it out or make progress. So um, I remember coming home from school one day and my dad, was in the living room with the guitar and he was like had like a mel bay book out and he was like plunking away on like green sleeves or like ode to joy one of these little two string a2 yeah. and i was so frustrated that he'd figured something out before me <laughs> I, I would like give me that thing and i you know figured out some stuff on my own and then once i like started to connect the dots i realized that you know um i just you know, memorizing patterns and sequences and, and, and that sort of like the connection between 
I guess that side of my brain and like my ear and like passion for how music made me feel was like, okay, I think I really do like this. And, uh, I became obsessed with it. And, um, you know, and then we got an electric guitar at some point uh, as a made in Mexico, uh, Fender Strat in midnight blue, which is, which is purple. I don't know why Fender was playing games with that. It's, it's a purple guitar. It's not blue in the slightest. Uh, and I learned everything from Blink-182 and Green Day to Metallica to, I even had that thing in drop B, probably played some Slipknot. On like wow. a, you know what I mean? I did everything with that thing for so long. And then I graduated to a uh, Gibson SG standard in cherry red um, because I had, uh, um, I was the only guitar player in a large ensemble in my high school. I was in a music theater program. We were doing a large, like 300 person ensemble rendition of Bohemian Rhapsody. God, and that's like, massive. They wanted me to play the electric guitar solo and everything. And my dad was like, Oh, you know, maybe we should step it up beyond the purple strat. So we got the, the cherry, cherry red SG standard. And um, I did, I learned everything with that one too. It was like, I went from playing like anti-flag and rancid and AFI and everything on that to like tuning it down and using it in my first local band and stuff. And, um, it's kind of where, kind of where it started really. And then as far as the, the back half of your question, like first experiences with the music industry and stuff, I just was playing in local bands, um, really hungry for it. Um, you know, played with a bunch of, uh, like my closest friends in high school for a really long time. And, towards the end of high school, once I started like working a little and it would be, it'd be about the time, you know, one goes to college or university or something. Um, I, I didn't know exactly what it is that I wanted to do. So I took time. I managed to like, to get myself a job at a, at a flagship local music store here in Toronto on Queen street called, uh, Steve's music, which is like a, you know, it's an iconic shop here in the city. And, uh, a little bit of a crossroads with the people I was playing with at the time, tried some other things with a few other bands, filled in on some positions, yada, yada, yada. And then I discovered that you could get a little, little red bean thing that sits on your table called the Pod XT. And I got my first laptop and but my buddy, somebody gave me a cracked version of like Easy Drummer and Logic. And I just... Cracked version? I haven't heard cracked in a long time. Yeah, man. <laughs> Just for the record, now there's ev nothing for everything. <laughs> That's all right. You don't need a disclaimer. <laughs> we all start somewhere, right? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, um, started with that. I got a buddy who showed me how to map drums, and um, I was just off to the races from there. And the first thing I ever made was the first interval song ever. It's the wow. First thing I ever made by myself, and I haven't stopped since. And there's like no B-side tracks really made a couple little things that didn't make any albums. But since the time I started making music on my own with that like minimal setup, everything I've ever finished and committed to has been released under intervals. So you didn't, you were all self-taught then and just constant hours, hours, hours in, in neck time. A uh, few influential individuals like um, my band leaders in, in my high school music theater program, unbelievable musicians, you know, they were trying to show me all the stuff I didn't want to like, you know, when you're a young, you know, modes, ah, whatever, I just want to riff, you know, and then like later after high school, I was like, oh, Bob and Tom were right. I want to learn all the like expensive sounding stuff. So then I like did it on my own a little bit afterwards, but their voices were always, you know, in the back of my head, like, this is what you should do. And this is how you shape your ear. And this is how you should, you know, do all these types of things. And I did have, um, I did some private tuition with a with a guitar instructor named Paul Brensis is just a local guy in Toronto and hmm. you know he his approach was he taught at a local music store and he knew kids like didn't want to like sit and do you know unless their parents brought them there with the like sole sort of goal of like you know I want my kid to get ready for conservatory like play classical or do these types of things read music um his whole thing was I'll just teach you the songs you want to learn and we didn't know anybody at the time that would do that a lot of people wouldn't do that for you so I used to just bring him songs that I wanted to learn and he would take them away. And then the next week he would show me how to play strung out songs or green day songs or Blink 82 songs or Nirvana or whatever. And then when I would like come and get ready to like, you know, plugging in and getting ready tuned up for my lesson, he's always improvising and playing self accompanied. And I was always like, so mystified by like the ability to sound fluent by yourself no accompaniment there's no backing track there's no chord progression everything he plays like you can hear implied chords and at the time i'm too young to even understand but subconsciously your musical ear knows 
you can hear the movement in the way he's playing. He sounds so good by himself. And then, you know, he would have me play some chords and then he would improvise. And I was always too like afraid or embarrassed to do it. And then after a while, something clicked. I'm like, I need to learn how to do this. He started to show me scales and modes and stuff. And then I sort of grew beyond that, but that was the beginning of like, you know, um, sort of like those two approaches, which is like, you know, the more tactile, very calculated, like learn the song, learn the riff, this is it, it, get it ingrained, play it like dead perfect note for note. And then also this more like loose, like l trust your ear, vibe out, like, you know, and, and, and express yourself over a given progression or, you know, learn some things so you can like have some tools in the, in the bag, if you will, so you mm. can kind of pull on them, whether it's in a, you know, live type of situation or you never know when you're gonna find yourself needing to, to do that kind of thing. And even for us, like we play our music pretty much to a T live. There's some moments that, you know, are, are, um, we do improvise and leave some room for that. Um, but you always want to have that because in, in, in the like prog world and stuff, like you never know when you're going to, and you don't ever want to get caught where you can't. So I do really like to explore that stuff. And I've always liked kind of both approaches. So you're, you, are you an only child or you had any brothers and sisters? Only child, but I have a half brother um, who lives in China. He lives in Shanghai and he teaches there with his wife. Oh, that's and, cool. Uh, I didn't, uh, yeah, I, Brian and I connected later in life. Um, that's wild. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know, and it was something from my my dad's past, and uh, it's okay to talk about because he's super proud, and like our families are like you know very close now and everything. But it was interesting at the beginning of high school. I found out I have a brother, um, and yeah, so Brian lives in in Shanghai, and he, he and his his wife Leanne came to see me when I played in Shanghai, which is really cool. They teach oh, that's me. awesome. I brought some teachers from the school, and I was a wreck because we play. I think we were in Beijing the day before. We had come from. Hong Kong or something. And I mean, we were in the midst of, we did 21 cities in 24 days on that tour. And we started in Singapore and we finished in New wow. Zealand. I was sleeping like three hours a night. So I was a freaking disaster, but the show was awesome. <laughs> and I remember having like a, I think we were drinking like a Tsing Tao and eating a piece of pizza in the green room after the show with my brother in China. So it was random, but it was great. So. Yeah, that is cool. You know, it's weird. You're the second guy in like four days that told me I found out later in life. I had another, this, another guy I talked to found out he had another, a daughter. Oh, yeah, right. Oh, that's, that's a that's a yeah, different one, but I know, but beautiful, but yes. yeah, it was pretty wild. Jeez. Um, yeah, cool. but that's just wild to hear that's those two stories so close. Essentially, an only child, though. I mean, that's uh, yeah. You know, you grew up. Me in the house, me and my parents when I was younger, and they're like, you know, my biggest supporters. They're like super into everything that I was doing. So I was going to say they seemed really supportive of that, and that's actually the number one characteristic that all successful players have, I'd say 99% and change of the people I've spoken to had supportive parents. Which is interesting because you would think that maybe, you know, maybe adversity would actually create something that's, you know, maybe, maybe not more prolific, but like equally for a different reason or something, but I, a I rebellion to... re for rebellion. Yeah. 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 Maybe it's 98% because I've had close to 800 people on the show, maybe 20 it's a lot of damn you got a hell of podcasts that's <laughs> thanks i've been very fortunate uh yeah, yeah so maybe 20 people have been like yeah my parents wanted me to be a you know get a plan b really pushy you know i forced me to go to college but 97 98 percent are all it's gonna be harder because you need that like relaxed environment to be able to grow within and you need to just like it's okay to to sink six hours after school into you know or to sink your whole weekend into just like learn i mean dude i i got suspended in grade in the seventh or eighth grade for like the first and only like school fight that I had ever had. <laughs> and I, my dad tells the story all the time. I, he was like, he totally backed it. Cause my dad's like, you know, he's like the, uh, uh, he's like the Clint Eastwood of, <laughs> of what a buddy of mine said, calls him. Um, so he totally, he, I was, I was vindicated as justified. Um, the guy was talking shit about my dad. So, oh. it was like, you know, it's like, I, you know, it's totally fine. But anyway, um, I, he always tells the story about how I learned master puppets and like a bunch of other shit at home while I was suspended from school. And he was like, fucking right. Yeah, do that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. They were supportive. That's pretty cool. But you have a, where did you get that? You, you must be, uh, you know, 
you got to have a pretty good work ethic and a pretty good sense of drive to to do that because it sounds like you did a lot of made a lot of decisions about your playing and creating on your own. Where, where, where does that come from, you think? Or what do you get out of that emotionally? I'm not really sure. I mean, I'm pretty type A. I'm pretty like, mm, I don't know. It's just the way I'm wired, I guess. My mom's a go-getter. Um, I've always respected that. And um, uh, I just... I think that um, just like with anything, whether it's like the, you know, the music stuff or the gym or like, you know, anything that you do, like results are addictive. So yeah. when you put the work in, like even just like dip a toe and see a result, that's fascinating to me. And it's very, it's highly addictive. So being able to like master a song and, you know, be kind of worried that you can't really get, you know, you're sort of fluffing your way through it. And then you fall asleep and wake up in the morning and that pattern is ingrained in your head. And you're like, Ooh, 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 this does work. Like muscle memory is a thing. Like this brain is growing, you know? So that's, that's fascinating to me. And I just never stopped. I sunk like so much of my childhood into just like trying to, you know, be able to get around the instrument comfortably. And it's funny because I, you know, for as, as many songs, like I, I learned when I was younger and like, th you know, things that I actively wanted to cover and these types of things. I always was the guy who, you know, you're at like a, a family gathering or party or something and people are like, hey, the guitar guy's here, you know, play, <laughs> they, you know, calling requests and stuff. And it's like, I know none of it. I just know how to like, play what's in my head, which was always embarrassing. I always felt really bad about that. I always felt like, oh, is a guitar player supposed to be a jukebox? Like, am I supposed to just know all the songs? And, you know, and funny enough, like now that I have a catalog of my own music and like when I sit down to create, I just make for me and then release because now at, at this point, very you know grateful to have a fan base that, um, you know, appreciates the, the take on the style of music that I make. And sure. so like, I feel, I feel very fulfilled that I can just explore what's in my head. It makes me feel good. And I'm lucky to be able to share that with people. Um, but I, I talk to people who are like, you know, they're like, they have a, a really high profile side gig with a pop artist, or maybe they have a degree and they do like a lot of like um, session work and stuff. And the big thing is always like, I look at what they do and I respect that craft so much. I'm like, wow, the fact that you can show up, embody a particular style or learn something and make the artist feel comfortable. And you don't have to like, you know, you're not always in the like limelight, but you get to be part of a musical production. Like I've always, I've often wondered like, oh, you know, what would that feel like to be on the sort of on the side and stress a little less and just be able to like do the job? you know, grass is always greener kind of thing. But those type of people are always like, I just want to play my originals. I just want to write stuff. It's so cool that like, you don't just recite whatever, or do the wedding gig or do this or whatever. They like, you just, you just play whatever and there's an audience for it. And you know, you're, you're, it's a means to an end for you. So, okay. Yeah. Grass is greener, but uh, I don't know. I've just, that's the route that I decided to take was I just want to like get better at expressing myself and, um, it's funny because I've been doing it for a while now. Intervals is like going to be, it's going to be like a decade soon. Yeah, I, sure. I don't even feel like I'm close to like potential. I, you know, sometimes I think bands, it's like, wow, you know, they might've set the bar high with like their inaugural release or their sophomore. And then it's like, then you, they got to figure it out for a while. And then maybe it peaks again somewhere later. I just feel like it's this and I don't see it's, going any other way except because I every single release I feel like I'm learning more getting better I'm making sure I don't do the things I didn't want to do last time making sure I'm capitalizing on the things that I know are you know that are just going to make the music better and I'm always finding new things that fascinate me and stuff like that I think it's only going to get better until I hang it up awesome you know, that's just how I feel about it so well, you know, the expression school's never out for the pro man that's how I, I believe I, I just took my first piano lesson yesterday there you go. Uh, let me ask you this: what, what, uh, what made you start intervals, and what were some of your early your challenges early on? Mm. Well, I yeah, so I was playing with like a bunch of, um, and, you know, my my childhood friends um, from like you know elementary school and high school and stuff. And um, when I discovered the little you know recording rig um, and 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 the ability to compose. Uh, and like finish a competent piece, fully realized piece of music. Um, 
like I said, I, I, I'd, I'd finished that first interval song and I had a friend who was really getting into video work and he sort of convinced me that it would be worth my time to sit in a chair and play it like six or eight times or whatever. And he's going to shoot me from all these different angles and cut together a video. And I'm like, that sounds like a low budget music video, dude. I, I don't know <laughs> Who wants to watch that. And honestly, the term playthrough video at the time, not a thing like 2010, 2011. It's like, you might've found some like multi-cam, multi-angle videos of some guys playing on the internet, but YouTube was pretty new. Um, social media was still getting its footing. Like Facebook was like still, you know, chronologically algorithmic and there was no like fucking weird, you know, ads and all kinds of crazy stuff going on. It was, it was a different world. I, One I, weird I, trick. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I, I was still using MySpace. Right, right, right. Started. So different times, but um, we made this video and my buddy's like, well, you got to call it something. And I didn't want to use my name. And, you know, it's just not very creative to just use like the plural thing or whatever, you know, it's like, I'm not the most in love with it, but it, it is what it is now. And I think that a lot of artists aren't in love with their, maybe their, you know, their stage name or their band name or whatever. Some, there's some that say that and they have great band names and I'm like, okay. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's a good, yeah. I don't, I works for music. It's fine. It's just, I came from a time when there was like so many of the plural bands and like things like that. So like I get, I get lumped in with that often, but, um, really? I well, I think it's a great name for a band that, that never I, crossed, never crossed my mind once. I think, I think, it's, I think it's perspective. So yeah. in Toronto, there was a, there was like a, a metalcore, a deathcore band called Structures that was like coming up at the same time. And then you've got Architects are one of like the biggest, you know, in, in our sort of uh, sphere and sort of the metal world and stuff like that. So there's like a handful of the, you know, you've got monuments from the UK. There's like a lot of these plural bands. So like, uh, okay. you know, it, it, just in the back of my head, like I always think about, nah, it would have been cool to maybe do something different. But honestly, I didn't plan for this to be the means to my end at all. I yeah use the term like just the, t uh, the moniker if you will to just have something to to call the music that wasn't my name because it was just like a placeholder or something temporary and then we shared it on uh, my personal facebook i didn't have a page at the time via youtube of course and uh i had never done numbers like that there's never been any traction for anything i had ever done with a local band anything this thing just like started to get I don't know, it was going off on sevenstring.org and it was getting shared on all these different places. And because Facebook worked a little different, you could actually go semi-viral just from interaction and so-and-so commented. So that person, next person sees and da-da-da. So it was in the friends list. It was in the news feeds and racked up like thousands of views quickly. I'd never seen anything like that before. And then I made another song and... Honestly, like Matt Halpern from the band Periphery hit me up and we, you know, we had all been like friends early on and uh, asked if I had a drummer for the project. I remember I showed the Periphery guys, they were in town. I showed Matt in the van, like one of the early intervals demos. He thought it was sick. Um, he introduced me to my first drummer, Anoop, who used to be a student of his and they're local to each other and everything. Asked if I had a drummer, you know, you should get this guy to play on your stuff. Um, I had already been a fan of Anoop's from watching his videos on YouTube and he lived 10 hours from me. It seemed really lofty. I didn't drive, but he did. So I was like, Oh, maybe we can make this work. He was excited to do it. And I had two songs at the time. I knew, and I started to sort of converse and go back and forth about stuff. I think Matt found out that we were talking. He just assumed there's a body of work and enough to, to be able to do something. He says, periphery is coming through on tour to Toronto. Do you guys want to open the show? Wow. I was, I was bluffing, punching above my weight going, yeah, absolutely. Meanwhile, there's no other band members. It's me and a drummer. I've got like two songs. So I rushed to write like an intro, two more songs. That was the space between EP. I put it together just to be able to play a damn show. A new drove 10 hours from Frederick, Maryland to Toronto. We rehearsed for under 90 minutes in my parents' basement. And we played our first show opening for Periphery, the Human Abstract, Contortionist, and Textures. And that's I never stopped doing it ever since. So you sort of like, it was almost, you fell into it in a sense. You're like, Absolutely. you were forced into it in a way. That wow. Was. What a cool story. Yeah. It's funny. I had Misha on this show a while back. Nice. Yeah. yeah, yeah we yeah. each other for ages. And funny enough, you know, there's a Toronto connection with Misha because he used to go to, I believe it was University of Toronto for philosophy, I think. Yeah. He's, I, I think, think so. Yeah. I and, remember. He had, and he had a, like, 
he had an apartment in the city and he lived here. We didn't know each other at the time. He had actually just moved back to Maryland right around the time we connected online. And he was like doing all the like early sound click demos. And he was like one of the guys really driving the like home, like budget recording rig thing. And I had found his stuff. Funny enough, I had mentioned that band structures. My friend Nick, who was the original vocalist in the band, sent me some sound click links. And he's like, yo, have you heard this? And it was under the moniker Bulb. And I was like, oh, I've yeah, that's funny. never heard this stuff before. And I was like, already sort of just figuring out the what I was doing. And I was like, yep, that's, yep, this is 100% you can do this. So, um you know, it's funny too, because I took like, so the periphery guys were probably one of the first bands that you could see actively teaching on tour. They, you know, they're very forward thinking. They've always had uh, all kinds of other like ancillary ways of generating income and stuff because, you know, touring in the early days, especially they were their six piece band at the time, hard to make ends meet. So they're like, uh-huh. Members were touring or were um, teaching on tour and stuff. And uh, one of the first times Misha ever taught an in person lesson on tour was with me in the basement of the Opera House in Toronto. That's pretty cool. And I wow. booked a lesson and he was like, what are we doing? You don't need a lesson. I was like, I just want to play guitar. Yeah. I, I look up to you. Like, you know, and yeah. then it's funny because I just got my Spotify 2020 wrapped, like my year end, just my personal one, like everything that I was listening to and stuff. And it's a really strange list of music, but because Misha had re-released all the bulb stuff this year, I was reliving those demos like crazy, like on walks to and from the gym or in the gym and stuff, listening to them, like just, like on loop because it's just so nostalgic for me. So he was in my 2020 wrapped and he shot me a message. And, you know, we talked from time to time, but uh, it's just funny that all these years later too, like, you know, it's, uh, it's still special to me and not so much just for like, I mean, my music doesn't really sound like his. I mean, I, I guess there's some similarities, but um, it's more so just like, I was just inspired by like his ethic at the time and the fact that it's like he, you know, was just kind of kicking the door down saying like, you know, you don't need the excuses of like, this guy doesn't live in my city or I can't find a drummer. I don't know a bass player. It's like, you don't need any of it. You can just do it. Yeah. Yeah. He's got a lot of side hustles. I do remember that, man. Yeah. Oh yeah. Big time. Yeah. That's cool. What a good story, man. So you're like, see, and like, I would also say most musicians, have something like this where like uh they didn't really push but like it was you know they they just love playing music and it's almost like destiny or karmically things aligned for yep. them to you know which is really amazing man it speaks a lot to the value of just pursuing something you love you just gotta be you just have to like i don't know i mean it might sound woo woo but it's like that law of attraction type stuff like you have to put yourself in positions that open you up for the universe to deal you on right off the top of the deck. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? It's like, you, totally. If, yeah. If you're not, if you're not sitting at the table, you know, and when the, when the match starts or when the, you know, whatever analogy you'd like to use, uh, then you're just not, you're just not there. You yeah. know, you have to just, and, 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 and it doesn't mean obsess and try hard, uh, you know, try hard, like just be there. Do you be friendly with people? Just be express yourself honestly through art and set yourself up so that when the universe knocks and says, here's an opportunity that you know how to like, you know, recognize that and do what you need to do. Funny enough, like, you know, I had accepted a show way before it was even possible for us to, and then it lit the fire under my ass to like find a couple other guys to be able to play a noobs coming up from, from Maryland where we're going to do this, um, you know, and then the, the one that really kicked it off and the one that it was a couple moves down the line, but um, we had, intended to release the in time ep which is the sophomore ep at a show um in toronto just a single show just again same kind of vibe we're just going to open a show in toronto and because of like playing with local bands and knowing some local promoters i i was able to always figure out like how to get on shows i knew who to talk to and stuff and uh a, a band called veil of maya who in 2018 we did a u.s co-headliner with so it's so crazy to fast forward yeah. Uh, but at the time, you know, Sumerian records band look up to them like crazy. Mark's such an animal on guitar. I love those guys. And 
they were um, coming through to do a show and it was Vail Maya. They had a, a short tour as a Quebec and Ontario. Vail Maya, the contortionist, and a man called Your Memorial. And uh, we just wanted to open the show and release the EP. So I'm, you know, getting CDs made. I'm planning. I'm getting ready to like drop this thing. Um, and then what ends up happening is Vail Maya got a tour offer to go to Europe with the Devil Wears Prada and they decided to can their Ontario and Quebec run and uh, they'd make up for it another time. But, um, you know, big opportunity came up for them and they decided to take it. So, you know, respect, you got to do what you got to do. Sure. So I was concerned though, that uh, we would lose our EP release show and, you know, just living in my own world. So I'm just like, Oh, what are we going to do? You know? And, um, talking to my manager at the time, um, my first manager with somebody else currently, but, um, his name was Brett Powell and I owe so much to Brett. He's like the, you know, the dude who grabbed this project and really kind of structured it and built it into what it is now and taught me how to take my ideas and actually execute. Um, but Brett was the drummer in a band called the human abstract and, and, you know, we met at that first periphery show, funny enough, because the human abstract was on tour of periphery. He saw intervals play for the first time. He kept in touch for a year, kept saying, let me manage your band. I said, no, 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 no for a year. And then we ended up actually engaging. And, and this was like the beginning of our working relationship. So we had this thing coming up. We planned to put the EP out. It's not going to happen. It looks like because of the, the show, we drop it online, but we're going to lose our little release show. So um, I'm talking to Brett and I said, what are the odds that all of these promoters aren't willing to like just cancel the shows, refund all the tickets. Do you think the contortionist is a big enough band that they'll just assume the role of headliner in lieu of, of Vail and Maya going to Europe and that contortionist in your memorial come do these like 12 shows in Quebec and Ontario? He goes, I don't know. I should look into it. I know the agent though. So he phones the agent and he gets back to me and he goes, yes, it's still on. So uh. good on you, per, you know, very perceptive. Uh, but do you want to open all 12 shows? Wow. I, like, I was like, uh, that was in the back of my head and it was going to be the thing that I asked for next. But funny right, enough, right. because Brett went to the agent and they're close friends, he comes back and he's like, you can have the whole thing if you want. I was like, dude, we don't own a vehicle. We don't own a trailer. We barely have other members other than Anoop and I at the time and stuff. I was like, oh my God. So I hit up Anoop and I'm like, yo, we got this opportunity. It's going to be longer than just the release show. Da, da, da. We can like actually do a first like local tour around Ontario and Quebec and this and that. And he goes... I just got contacted by Steve Joe at Century Media and they want me to play drums in Europe for Jeff Loomis and I can't do it. And I was like, no, we're going to, uh, so funny enough, Nathan who plays drums with me now was like, I scrambled to find somebody and somebody was like, there's this guy in Cambridge, Ontario. It's like 40 minutes away. I think you could do your stuff. You know, so he learned material. Nathan filled in back in the day. And then it was years later until Nathan re-entered the picture, funny enough. But Nathan stepped in and saved us at a crucial time where I was going to lose, like, the biggest opportunity that we had ever had. So um, I can't rent a van because I'm too young. A buddy of mine took work off, ended up losing his job over it. And he rented a van for us and sold merch for like nothing. Like shout out to Jason. What a legend. Um, we all climbed in this rental van when it did the shows. It's so funny now because like we've toured, I mean, in 2018, we did an evening with the contortionists. It was just the contortionists in intervals for like, we had like an hour plus set. They did two sets. Like we did a full North American run like that. Um, wow. you know, all these years later and stuff, I'm still close with the, your Memorial guys. My buddy Blake lives in Minnesota. He's a realtor. Now he's doing b crazy things that we always comes in. We have tacos or whatever, whenever in Minnesota, I love those guys, you know, but the crazy thing was the Toronto show of that tour. We played at sneaky D's, which is like an iconic spot here. It's like a punk rock venue. And somebody from the agency group was there, saw the show and goes, do you want a, f a legitimate cross Canada tour in the spring? And if, we, and if we had ever done any of those things, like if I never like got Jason to like take time off and rent the van, if I didn't like find someone to like fill in for a noop at the time, we would have never had our first, first legitimate engagement with a booking agent. And that was Halifax to Vancouver with, uh, it was intervals, North Lane from Australia, Texas in July from the U S and structures who were like the hometown heroes, like good buddies. We went coast to coast 
And that was the beginning of like a working relationship with a real booking agent. Ever since then, we started to get more opportunities. We built out international relationships with agents and it never stopped. But it, it, so that's like the extension of taking that first opportunity. If we had never done that enough, if I had never improvised in some tight little moments and instead of just like being like, oh, drummer's unavailable or, oh, we don't have a vehicle or we can't do it or, oh, there's no money in the bank or whatever. Like we would have, I would not be here. Without wow. Those things. See, that's the thing, man. You got to do the work underneath. But yeah, that is so cool. Look what that happened, man. And it yeah. was literally just a cascade of events that just turned into what this thing is now. It's always saying yes, even if in the back of your head, you know, there's a chance that this Bingo. Is an absolute streak. You got to punch above your weight. Yeah. Because yeah. There's so many other people will eat your lunch if you're not ready for it. Somebody else would take that opportunity in a heartbeat. Absolutely. I like what you said. You got to eat above your weight, man. That's, that's a good one. So uh, question for you, uh, if you're comfortable answering it, turnover in the band has been an issue, yet you and intervals are incredibly popular. So I was curious regarding the turnover, what have you learned from that experience? Like what, what does it take away from you? Well, it's interesting, right? Because um, I think, well, before I get into like the, the details, like I think it's a testament to the music. I think it's exactly just- yeah, well that's what I'm saying that popularity it, you know because usually it's like Aerosmith any band it's like oh I love this guy this guy and there's a a relationship with the band sure sure even like I- yeah I know and it's it's kind of weird to me because while I am like fanatic about all my favorite artists and like certain things and there's a soft spot like if you were to remove, unless it's something super integral, I, I don't see how that could affect, unless the recipe for writing the music or something tangibly changes in the product, yeah. then okay, sure, maybe it's up for discussion. But like this idea of being so concerned with changing members, like again, if it's not like the soul driving, if it's not the visionary, then I, I, don't, I don't see the issue with it. But here's the thing. So it started off me just making stuff by myself when it got going and started to get traction, yes, 100%, like Anoop was in the picture, you know, we were doing everything together. um, And then um, there were some previous members as well. There's a guitar player named Lucas. And in the early days, there's a bass player, actually, this never gets talked about and he deserves a ton of praise. This, his name is Matt DeLuca and he was a local bass player. And we used to call him party boy. Cause he looked like Chris Pontius from Jackass. Um, <laughs> but uh, I miss Matt too. He's a great player. And he's one of those dudes, session guys show up and just rock your wedding and play every song under the sun. Perfect. And he's so good. He plays in a salsa band. Now I think he's like, you know, my stuff was like, I always felt like he was way above our like, you know, he was in a different level, like just the way he touched his instrument, how he dialed his tone. I was like, man, you're classy, dude. I don't know about this. Well, like, your music's pretty in specific and intense, man. I wouldn't don't don't knock it because you're what you're doing is not simple by a long shot. No, I appreciate it. I'm just too close to it. But um, <laughs> so, yeah. So anyway, so like that, that was, it was us four in the beginning. And I'll tell you, I didn't want to be the brain brains behind the operation because that's stressful to me and coming from playing with like you know and shout out to my friends that i played in bands with before like love all these guys to death but the reason that things like didn't really gel is because there was it wasn't possible to to delegate and if we did delegate things didn't happen a certain way and like okay call me like you know like a uh, a perfectionist or like you know or like you know and someone's gotta be the chef you have to be you have to <laughs> And it's like herding cats. Otherwise, you're never going to get them to run in the same direction. It's just, and, and these, it's such a challenging industry to like get things off the ground that, you know, even if you ask my manager, like he'll tell you, like he deals with a bunch of bands that are super successful and, and like, you know, bigger than intervals and stuff, but it's so much easier to just deal with me because it's like, we just have a conversation and then we just do the work. Yeah. Whereas like, you don't have to be like, you have the conversation, but then so-and-so is not okay with it. So now it changes and you lose the plot. You know, so anyway, um, I wanted a Democrat, uh, democratic sort of like orthodox arrangement. And then I really wanted that to, in the early days. So when we started to get gain traction and everything, I, you know, that's how the band was marketed and, and, and stuff. And I felt really good about that. Um, Matt no longer wanted to continue playing with the bass with intervals because, you know, session stuff was paying better and, you know, it's going to be a long grind, uh, to get 
this thing to where it needs to to be to be able to sustain for individuals and stuff and hold let me interrupt one second anything this is what people don't get though any business you start you know i always say it's like this you gotta it's a it is a grind but you gotta get the plane to get lift off and get the wheels off yep you know and that is really hard to do certainly is and and, and the thing is he's just a little, he was a little older and in a certain situation with his partner and you know his life and bills to pay and stuff and he's just like you know it, it, it's the, not the, right yeah the engagement and the involvement is going to go up so i need to put more time in but i'm not going to reap the reward that i need and he's like you know that's a sad reality but so you know so matt moved on and that's okay i was at the nam show in like 2012 or 2013 and uh i was introduced to um a noob's good friend, Alex Rudinger, who's a drummer who plays in a bunch of, you know, a lot of high profile metal acts. I think he's still playing with Whitechapel currently. And um, at the time he was playing in the, I think it was the Faceless. And yeah, I can't remember exactly what was going on. My, Mike was, and then we met Mike uh, Simeski, who ended up singing for intervals. And the way it worked though, was that he was in a band called the heart machine and it wasn't working out. And I think Rudy had left the faceless or whatever was going on. And the, both of them were really close with the noop. We all met at Nam, and it was like, Oh, we just want to, you know, see these guys land some gigs and do some stuff. And at the time, some opportunities coming up needed a bass player got this cross Canada thing. I was talking about first legit yeah. bring cross Canada tour and we need a bass player. Uh, I wasn't open to the idea of programming or doing pre-recorded bass at the time. So, um, Alex told Anoop, you know, while Mike is a, a talented vocalist, like he'd love to play bass in intervals. He can actually play some stringed instruments. He can really hold his own. You guys need somebody. He's local to Anoop and, and, and Anoop knew Mike. So it was like, let's get Mike on bass. So we got Mike on bass and we, you know, that lasted for, um, about that tour because somewhere in the midst of it and we had been toying with the idea that you know maybe this is a little under where you know mike's potential lies and i had never fully ruled out whether or not the project would have vocals or not and uh it was very challenging to decide that of course because you know we were starting to really become like a you know a notable name in the instrumental world at the time and stuff and uh i was seeing what I've, you know uh, at the time there wasn't many other acts like polyphia and sean weren't even really doing much so it's like they were just in their infancy we were a little forward out, out the gate animals as leaders is probably like the most household name for you know right. instrumental metal in our world and i was like no that for sure there's going to be a whole scene i could predict it i was like this is going to get big in the next couple of years for sure i really wanted to stick to that but also under the guys of you know this progressive sort of um umbrella i was like well am i not the antithesis of that if i don't try everything at least once you know and i, I think i maybe put a little too much faith in the fan base to be like forgiving of that i didn't realize that people get so married to things and that like you're going to make new fans who didn't know you were instrumental before and then the instrumental core fan base is going to be like kind of off put by vocals unless they're open-minded so you part the red sea just within that little demographic I didn't know how to predict it. I was just like, oh, we're all like progressive fans. Like they just like what we do. So we're going to try stuff and they're going to be with us. I was very naive. Um, so <laughs> no, I mean, it was, yeah, but you know, you don't know what you don't know. And you know, you got to where you're at by open and trying new things and everything I'm doing now is a product of the mistakes that I made, the things right. that I had once and went like, it's cool, you know, but it's not us or not me. So, um, Anyway, to kind of speed things up a little bit, basically we end up touring with Mike on bass. I remember we were at a show in Winnipeg. We're at the West End Cultural Center. We were playing a show. We we're in the van. It's raining outside. Uh, the guys sat me down. The guys being Lucas and Anoop, you know, I've been thinking about it and like we really want to try to have Mike sing on the new material. I talked to my manager about it. I had been thinking about it like crazy, and I, I was like, you know what? Yeah, I think we, I think I think we should try it. I think it's worth a shot. So we wrote a voice within. Um, you know, I, I had already been, I started composing some of the music for it. We continued to work on it. I rejigged my approach to make sure that I wasn't stepping on broom for the vocal. And then I wrote guitar to sort of support the vocal in a way that still had the identity of intervals, but let Mike, you know, do what he needed to do and everything. Very proud of that record. Very proud of that time period. We did our first Europe tour, Protest the Hero and Tesseract. Off the back of that, we did, uh, 
U.S., full U.S., right after, like not even two weeks after with Protesting Hero. We flipped our van on the night our record came out. Holy shit. <laughs> crazy shit see this is why people become sidemen <laughs> seriously i mean it's like who wants to do you know a lot of people be like i i would love to have my own shit but who wants to deal with that it's a lot of a lot of responsibility a lot of work man. craziness yeah. so we had some more touring toured with periphery during that cycle toured with the contortionist again on that same tour um put the work in and then at the end of that year you know after like 100 plus shows um i knew like just deep within me intuitively this isn't this isn't the thing how did the fans respond what was the you know you had all these predictions half of this and what was the well it was nuts because look we started a europe tour and we didn't even tell anybody we were coming with a vocalist we played show one in germany and just let the internet find out that the band has a <laughs> single, which was a crazy move and then i remember also being at vega it's a venue in denmark uh, in copenhagen and our pre-orders were going live for the record that night and the, the merch company we were dealing with at the time leaked the record to a bunch of fans by accident. And there's like, cr I'm like five minutes before stage. I just found out from my manager, our album just leaked like a whole month before. It's by accident. <laughs> Here, listen, I'm giving this to you because you're my buddy. Don't show it to anybody. <laughs> yeah. No, what happened was the merch company actually was supposed to just do an instant, instant uh, gratification, like single download of the, first song out with the with the pre-orders and stuff and they just put the whole zip file in in a bunch of fancy oh my god so my manager tracked them all down actually and we just sent them upgraded merch packages and just asked them that they don't share it and it never leaked oh that's cool it actually that's, never leaked which that's is great the great fans like they're yeah. so awesome you know they appreciated that we would even like get in touch and kind of like make it a little sweeter for them and stuff yeah so, yeah, so we did all that anyway. So like did the touring, it just wasn't, it just wasn't working and it was like causing some tension with, you know, between like the core of the group and, um, and with, with management and everything. And it just wasn't, we were losing the plot. Um, <laughs> that, that, no, I love that expression, man. It's just, that's not, it's my wife's from the UK and she says that, but that's not an American expression. It's so funny. To, I've never heard anybody else say that. <laughs> we're, we're Commonwealth. The queen's still on our money. So yeah, we're losing the plot. Losing, we were losing the plot big time. Uh, so uh, it just didn't feel right. And I can't continue to create under the guise of something that, you know, especially like this, like sort of, I don't know, it was changing and it, and it just wasn't feeling honest. And that was making me feel. Yeah, you're not writing music for yourself at that point to my stomach actually so yeah uh, it just what it just wasn't working so um basically we had a a powwow at the end of that year and decided that it probably needed to change but i hadn't we hadn't fully decided whether or not we'd let somebody else audition if we want to replace that role continue on down the same path i was worried that if we kept like fuddling um you know with like trying another vocals and it doesn't we're, we're just gonna it's gonna be bad news so um basically everyone decided that it needed to change everyone being the you know myself the other members my manager we had we took a vote majority ruled that it needed to change so um we did that and we did open the door for you know the potential of some auditions and stuff like that but it just it wasn't feeling right. And this is some very talented people sent some submissions in and shout out to all of them because, you know, I really, I really do appreciate the effort and the attention and stuff. Um, but it, it, in my head, I was like, you know what, if we're going to, if I'm going to take the wheel again and make this thing, the, you know, fully realize it from where, you know, the beginning and how I always envisioned it, then now would be the time to just grab it and go. I knew I needed to do something polarizing. I wasn't feeling so good about continuing to rehash like low tuned, you know, drop tune riffs and some of the heavier stuff just wasn't feeling honest. So, um, January, 2015, I had, um, I had to uh, have some surgery. I had heart surgery. Yeah, I read about that, man. That was pretty intense. Yeah, and it was like, you know, it's, it's something I was born with, and it's like, you know, like one in 12 or 15 people or something will have this particular thing. It's just a birth defect, just needs to get cleaned up. So um, it was impacting my quality of life, and I, I needed to, to get that addressed. So How long um, did, was the recovery on that? Um, like two weeks. I was at a periphery show like a week in. Uh, oh, my God. 
Yeah, they were in town. Like I remember, yeah, I, they told me not to to go out and like walk around a lot and stuff. It was um, I don't, you know, they didn't like go in this way. It's like a micro, uh, oh. they, at, uh laparoscopic where they go, yeah. go through an artery and like near the like kind of like the groin area. But like you're, wow, I was semi conscious. It's a crazy. Experience. Yeah, I can't imagine what that's like. You're like watching it. I don't ever do. No, that. no, I'm not. I'm not that dude. Trust me. I'm. I like being really boring when it comes to my health. <laughs> oh, that's good. Um, so. Yeah, anyway, so basically uh, woke up from that and uh, just felt like I needed to get going. You know, if that doesn't rattle the cage on you, then I don't know what's going to Yeah, uh, And, it, and it, it wasn't disrespecting my health or anything like that. It was just something that I needed to get cleaned up. It was just the, the way I was, I was always wired and it was time to fix it. So, mm. um, Everything cool now? Everything's cool now, yeah. Good. And, and, and health and, and fitness and everything is, you know, um, something that, became a priority for me in the last, you know, towards like the end of my twenties and stuff. So, uh, yeah. very, very important, you know, diet, fitness, well, lifestyle, all that stuff. So, well, let me tell you, that's about when I started, I started training like when I was 23 and you, you first do it for like vanity. Cause you want to look good. Well, now that I'm 57, let me tell you, it's the greatest thing I ever did because I see me, I see not my peers and my mobility, my ability and my energy and my ability to bounce back from, things it, it it changes the meaning now i go to the gym not for vanity but to take you know i to support myself you know it's my health that's my health care big time and it and it plays a massive impact on everything in your life absolutely um so just to kind of get to the end of this bit basically woke up and like knew i needed to just get moving on whatever needs to happen next so i decided i'm going to be as honest with myself as possible i'm just going to sit down write the music that comes out um, we were still sort of in this weird transitional thing where, you know, we had let Mike go, um, and we were trying to figure out what the, what the deal is really. So there was a discussion that sort of revolved around if we revert to instrumental and the band stays the same, that we need to have like the most collaborative approach to making, uh, the, you know, whatever this new music is. And I said, absolutely. Cause I'm tired of doing it all myself. And I really just want to be able to like create a product that is like the amalgamation of all of our voices. And I started writing and I was like reaching out and the guys weren't getting back to me. And it was like months of radio silence. And I spent 2015 writing the shape of color and it was done in March or April and we finally got everyone to respond to an email thread. And my manager called like a little town hall and we all jumped on and it was like, Hey, where you, what's up? Where you been? How's everyone doing? And then it was like, okay, here's the deal. I've got eight songs and they're done. And now would probably be the worst time to tear them apart and collaborate because this should have happened. Uh, you lost the collaboration, right? By ignoring. Yeah. No, you know what, man? I can't stand when that shit happens. When someone bitches at you about something and you're like, you know what? You're right. I'm going to be open-minded, whatever you need. And then they don't fucking show up. It's like, <laughs> yeah, I think it was just, it was just like a lot of like, so there was just some dissonance because I, the guys I never really like, I think in their mind, like signed off or committed to that like approach. And they were maybe waiting for a new vocalist to turn up and do it that way. But uh, I'm not going to blow a whole year in the timeline of this career and like, let this thing turn into just this weird, like obscurity that I, I it's like, no, now is the no, time. Man, you had traction. You worked hard. I mean, what are you going to do? No, man, you did the whole right thing for sure. I mean, for Absolutely. whatever. Yeah. I think no, I feel, I, I feel, I feel looking back on it, that, that it is what needed to happen. And I've always been, I think, I've prided myself on trusting my intuition. So had to do it. It, it had got me that far and we had yeah. done all the touring and released all this music and we're starting to really get going. And I was like, you know, I, I have to, uh, I have to do this. So the record was finished. Um, we had a conversation to say, look, like it might not be the most collaborative, but there's definitely room for you guys to inject your personality. I'd love you to have you guys play on the record and then we can tour it going forward and then really settle back into this and then do what we, we intend to do. And the guys were okay with that for about 48 hours. And then they came back <laughs> and they said that they had had a powwow and that they just wanted out. And I, it was like, well, honestly, like if that's what's best for you and you guys need that, then like, I'm not, you know, 
I'm who am I to like tell you to stick around? Although I will admit that I absolutely did plead with my drummer and Oop and, and, you know, he and I got it going and, and I miss him and like, he's a dear friend and I knew it would change our relationship. And, um, my dad called him and told him he was making a mistake and that he needed to, you know, but he wanted to take, uh, he wanted to take the other member side and, and they just decided that you know, they didn't like the way it was going and they wanted different things. And, after all the pleading and everything, I realized, you know what, you can't just put pressure on that. I can't make you stay. I can't make, you know, so I guess I'm left holding the wheel by myself. So right. I, I hired Travis Orban, who's a known session drummer in the metal world. Who's just amazing at being able to create an entire body of work on drums and show up and do the session and read it off a chart and deliver it. Exactly. You just no there's no surprises with this guy. It's going to be what, you know, it's going to facilitate the thing that needs to happen. So we brought him up to, to, uh, just outside Toronto. We tracked drums for the record. I had recorded all the guitars with Cameron McClellan, who, uh, was playing bass for protest the hero at the time. He's a close friend of theirs. And, uh, we put that out and I thought that this thing is either going to do it's going to do well or it's going to tank and I'm going to, you know, fold it, fold up this operation and figure out what's next. And we released it, uh, to the, probably the most acclaim that, that any intervals work had received. And I think that, you know, such a polarizing shift in the music, like you could really hear that I'm trying to be as honest as possible. It doesn't feel or sound exactly like everything before. Um, people were connecting with the music, the numbers were there. A uh, booking agent at the time and my manager come to me and were like, we should do a US tour. You should do a full North American tour and you should headline. And I was like, never done that. That's crazy. Uh, I don't even technically have a band. So like, what are we going to do? You know, I, I'm sure Nathan's on board, but who else is going to play? How are we going to do this? Um, if we're going to do it, like, especially headlining, I don't want it to be like low budget. Like it needs, production needs to be there. Are we going to travel in a bus? Like, do we even have it? If these are these real options and manager and booking agent were like, yes, we can get the budget. We can do the bus. You can get the crew. We can just, we can just go full tilt. I don't see why not. And I was like, wow, that is crazy. So, um, booking agent said carte blanche. You can pick whoever you want to be on the tour. Um, a year prior I had met, my friend Plenty for the first time in mm -hmm. Europe. Um, Plenty was backpacking around uh, Europe with his girlfriend at the time. He had just graduated school for architecture, uh, wasn't playing live music or anything, just had some music on the internet. We met at a show in Berlin. Uh, I put him on the guest list. Um, he actually held my Strandberg for the first time that night. That's the first time we ever saw one in person. Look at him now. Super funny. All right. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, we kept in touch and I told him if, there's, if there was ever an opportunity to give him a leg up in North America, I'd love to have him on something if he was willing to do it. I hit him up. He said, yep, now's the time. We came up with this idea where I was like, well, it's going to be brutally expensive for an Aussie to come tour with his whole band and like, you know, the visas and everything. And it's just going to be nuts. So how do we soften that for him and how do we make it a little better for us? So we decided to share a band and share crew and everything. And that's where wow. it was. Okay. It was the, this was like the beginning of that next sort of like everything that I did post AVW until now was born from like, let's tour together, but also maybe we can do this thing. And animals as leaders caught wind of what we were doing. And, and, you know, I think that, you know, for, bands that want to have like really strong support why wouldn't you bring out less bodies a house so, band basically so they yeah. ended up uh, we we had uh plenty of myself and my manager brett at the time and javier went for dinner around the nam show of that year and uh we talked about like you know let's have plentiful support animals in europe and then Plinervals. <laughs> That's awesome, man. <laughs> and so, we, so we went right from the shape of color headliner in North America straight into six weeks, seven weeks in Europe, mainland Europe and the UK with animals as leaders for the summer. And then I went to Australia with plenty. And then we did it again for the North American leg with animals as leaders. So it was plentivals and animals all year. And uh, we did about 18 or 19 songs a night. We would do plenty set 10 minute changeover. We literally just our tech would just swap our tuners and our, <laughs> and then I would stand center stage and the same band would deliver an intervals performance. Wow. That, 
So let me ask you this. Did you feel vindicated about your decision making? I'm sure that had to be like a we were doing the biggest shit we'd ever yeah, done. Yeah, that's great. Right and 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 I brought, I got to bring Nathan back into the fold who who was integral at saving the operation in the early days. We wouldn't be doing what, what we were doing now without him and the, the so is so and he's local to me. He's a great guy, unbelievable drummer, just an unbelievable person. I was like this is this is perfect. This is That's exactly right. it. And, you know, when you cut down on personnel and overhead and things like that, independent acts touring, the bottom lines look a little nicer on that spreadsheet. Yeah. We were totally. doing good. We were building something that's like, wow, we're coming home with, with the bag. Well, and you're getting fan bases from both, uh, both you know you're getting crossover fans. It's, it's with yeah. pollination. And like, there's a lot of core fans that were ask anybody who's like a intervals plenty or animals leaders fan about 2016 they like if they were at a show like they know like what this most unbelievable like night of music like that's just cool man so sick so we did that for a whole year and then then i shut down to make the way forward which was the release prior to the one that i've just put out and that's the one that came after the shape of color and uh then it was like well we can't continue to do the split thing between a bunch of aussies and canadians so we started to build our own band and our own crew and started to get a little more expensive because now intervals is towing the line on everything but i i knew it was another risk we needed to, to take and we needed to be able to fully solidify and go out and do it on our own so we geared up and did a cross canada co-headliner with north lane uh from australia finding more aussies but we, we toured together and did a cross canada co-headliner that summer then plenty and i teamed up and we did our first uh, music masters camp so we saw each other again at the end of the summer 2017 then we did intervals went to south africa and we did a co-headline festival with memphis mayfire in johannesburg and then we did our first european headliner um preemptively supporting the way forward at the end of 2017 intervals polyphia nick johnston then we went into the way forward headliner the beginning of 2018 when the record came out it was intervals jason richardson uh night versus and nick johnston and then, oh, yeah, evening with the contortionist, co-headliner with Vail Maya, did a whole Southeast Asia run, a uh, bunch of other stuff. And then we wrapped up the cycle with, I'm probably missing some shit too, but we wrapped up the cycle doing India for four shows, the biggest festival we've ever played in India. And did Those festivals are massive there. Bonkers is the m most wild Steve Aoki's video guy did our whole like light and video wall. And we played to like 12,000 people on a mountain somewhere. It's like China, India, Bangladesh border craziness. Wow. It's like 1400 meters above sea level. You're here in the clouds. It's just nuts. Um, did that. And then we went right into intervals between the Barry to me and Chon for like a full house of blues run. And then played the house of blues, Anaheim sat in the bus for three days, got home around Christmas chilled out for a little bit, did the NAMM show, went right back, saw Steve Vai at the same venue at the beginning of this year, came home, started to write a record, pandemic. Here you are. New record. Holy shit. Here we are. So that took a while, but that's pretty much everything. I missed a couple of things, but like- No, that was really interesting, man. And it, so it sounds like, you know, my, the second part of the question was, what have you learned from this experience? Is it fair to say that you got to stick to your guns uh, creatively and do what's in your heart? Yeah. Absolutely. Because you have to, you have to love it. You have to love it. And it's like, if you're just like, you know, trying to adhere to the current trend, you know, you see what's popular. I've seen this with a lot of young bands who have a lot of potential great players, but they found Polyphia three months ago and decided that that's what their new EP is going to sound like. It just isn't going to work for you guys. They put the time in to find their way. Look at the early days of Polyphia. They were like a neoclassical metal band. They weren't making like, you know, twangy, clean guitar, like trappy, you know, whatever. They've co they've really coined their own vibe and sound and everything. Um, you're just not going to be able to do that by just copying what's fresh right now. You have to channel what's honest to you and find whatever is, you know, you need to let that product become just just natural for me i feel like i'm exploring the things that i love and becoming more comfortable with my sound the further backwards i go into my influences the further into the early 2000s that i go 
the more I feel like I'm able to really channel what like moved me about music so early on in those like formative years that like it feels really honest when I take that and combine it with all of the modern sensibilities from, you know, everything that I've learned, you know, um, through touring as intervals and this like medium or this vessel that we like put the music out through, which is like instrumental progressive rock and metal. But I'm like thinking about like, all those early warp tour shows that got me excited and like uh-huh. all the like pop punk bands that I love and like trying to channel like that melodic sensibility. And then like thinking about like the first time I found like pendulum and drum and bass and like all this cool stuff. And like, you know, then I discovered like a lot of like eighties, like synth wave bands and things like that. And it's like these days I'm, you know, you see a wall of guitar gear here and I love guitar and it's my voice and it's what I do, but where I'm finding the most inspiration is what you can't see on the right here, which is like a little wall of synths that I got going on. And I've been really enjoying that. Like I said yesterday, I'm, I'm really trying to take it seriously. I, I, I took my first piano lesson. Um, I have like a little bit already, just enough to be able to embellish my productions the way I've been doing, but I, right. I, I need, I need more. Uh, I'm spending my time now, my downtime doing, you know, taking courses on synthesis and stuff. And I'm like, wholeheartedly diving into that because I want to add that element to what I do and feel like there's that whole other part of my musical passion that has been neglected. And I've bought myself the time to now try to meld those worlds and really try to continue growing upwards. I think there's so much more prolific music to make. Uh, I don't even, I haven't even scratched the surface. I'm very proud of this new record. We haven't even talked about that yet. That's no. just came out and it's what I spent the year making. And I, I truly feel it is the most concise and most like focused you know, representation of intervals and it's the, the most balanced amalgamation of the early sound, the new sound, new things, uh, you know, beyond that. But there's so much more. I feel like I'm still a hack that I have there's so much more, to do. I, I could be so much better than this. So it's also, when you talked your, the vibe, you, your energy was so much more positive when you basically, we talked about having a session players or, you know, not an ongoing band. Is that what your comfort level is moving forward? You're just going to bring guys in for the tour to that are on board with the music and to support that music? Because that's what it seemed like. Was- well, we, we have a, a great arrangement now where we have like a really, a very dedicated crew. You know, if you talk to any of our guys, they'll tell you it's not just about working for Aaron or, you know, whatever. It's team intervals. Like, that's how I see it, too. Like, just because I make the music and I'm the visionary or whatever, like we talked about, I think everybody that, like, really gets this stuff knows somebody's got to do that. Like, you can't, unless you do have that traditional, very rare scenario. Someone's got to run the business. And that's where it came from. It's the thing that put food on all of our tables. It's the reason we can go out and tour. It's the reason that, you know, the, that we all come together and we do this role. Everyone knows their role, right? Nobody begrudges anybody. There's no false expectations. I'll tell you right now, great company to work for because we prioritize the company, the team before, like I'm the last guy to eat this. We lose my shirt before you don't get what you deserve. Um, you know, whether it's a, you know, tech or another musician on stage, like my manager, we've, we've built this to where like, there's no false expectations. And as a result, everyone's always got a smile on their face. We have the best time. We could be waking up at 5 a.m. for a border crossing and everyone's joking around and nobody's miserable. Nobody's worried about not being able to pay their phone bill when they go home. Like the whole team goes home with the bag. Everybody's super excited. Like attitude's great. We love each other. And it's the best. I love my dudes. Everyone's there, you know, for each other. And it's always been that way. Nathan, since 2017, 2016, has been playing drums and that we don't intend to change that at all. Great friend. And he's just integral to the entire, you know, backbone of this, this whole thing. Jacob started 2017. He graduated Berkeley, went right into playing for intervals. This has been his main gig. Oh, wow. Uh, so again, another guy who's, it's always the bass player that's got the, like the credentials. Um, <laughs> and then I've had a, a number of, of, of second guitar players. It's been a lot. It started with Pliny we, we, where we were d- doing that, which is really funny. Yeah, and actually true. before that, Pliny was denied entry to America. We were really worried about that tour because we started the tour without him, meaning he wasn't even playing, like he wasn't there at all. So we had like some Quebec and Ontario shows where my buddy Sam Jacobs from Winnipeg, uh, he works for Rev Amplification, and he's also like a touring tech with a country artist named Dallas Smith, and Sam does his own thing. Um, Sam jumped in, learned the shape of color front to back in like 48 hours, flew wow. to Toronto, 
and we and and and, and he did the shows knowing that we would have to leave him at the border and maybe Pliny's on the other side. But we still have five weeks of touring in America. And wow. I, don't, I don't have, a, if, if this fucks up, I don't have a second guitar player. We don't have a direct support act. The whole thing's a disaster. So we really rolled the dice on that. But it was Sam, then Pliny. And then Sam came back into the fold and then he had to do a Dow Smith tour. So we brought in Thomas Griggs, who's an unbelievable fusion guitar player, jazz guitar player, also a Berkeley kid from Tampa. And then most recently, Travis Levere, who was in the band Scale the Summit and the band, uh, death metal band Entheos. And Travis is unbelievable. And I've known Travis for a really long time because Intervals played some of the early shows with Scale the Summit. And they're also like a bit of a household name. Um, and Travis was always like best dude in that whole crew. Uh, Jordan also went on to, who's also a legend, went on to play bass in The Contortionist. So we know those guys. Travis is great. Um, he stepped in big time because we needed somebody to come to India and go right into the Chon BT Bam tour. None of my other guys were available. Thomas had a prior engagement. Sam wasn't available. Uh, Travis learned the material, flew to Canada, did a little bit of rehearsing, played one club show in Mumbai, and then a one-hour festival set for like 12,000 people for his second interval show ever. That's wild, man. And then he's been like the guy, you know, and then we shut this year down to make the record and always intended to fire back up with him. He's still in the fold, um, you know, and, and we're just, yeah, we're just loyal to our crew and everybody who, who wants to, you know, who, who gives us, the, you know, their time, lends their time and their efforts to this whole thing. And it's, you know, it feeds us all. It, it, you know, it's the means to my end. It's what keeps me from being a crazy person. It gives me, it gives me meaning and, you know, especially well, now, like, well, the other thing is you already tried. Let's all be the leader. Let's all didn't work. And so, I don't even want to be that guy. No, I, would, I no, just but, part of a band. Someone's got to do that, man. And if it's you, that's fine. You're the writer of the music. Yeah, I, I get it, man. Yeah. It's not, it's not necessarily exactly how I would have it if I wrote the script, but I, I'm okay to do it. Yeah. And, yeah. And I feel, and I do feel good about it and it pushes me and it makes me grow every album and, well, the other thing is you're pretty serious about taking responsibility and that's the most important thing you need to do to be successful in anything, man. You I'll gotta, tell you what though, you know. without my manager, without Richard Fernandez, tandem management, not a, f not a freaking chance this operation would function the way it does. Well, that's cool, man. Not even close because he takes my craziness and he legitimately plugs it into like tactile, real like execution. Like, you know, and, and I know how to get stuff done because I told a manager for a year straight, I didn't want to have a manager. I was taking all this advice from like signed bands, like don't let anyone manage you. Don't ever ink a deal. Don't do this. So I told everybody, no, um, I gave in with the management thing. It's very necessary. When you get to a certain level, you absolutely need it. Just make sure you have the right guys in your corner. Um, and, and, on, and shout out to Brett as well, because I would, I'd never be here without Brett Powell. Um, Brett owns 1720, which is a venue in Los Angeles. That was his brainchild that was happening as, as Intervals was growing and Brett was growing in his own path. He, I mean, he was, you know, zoning and doing like bylaws and stuff for like a, you know, 800 capacity venue next to the American Apparel Factory in downtown LA. He's a little busy. Right. So we, we grew apart and we brought in Rich to handle the Canadian side of things. Rich works with Protest the Hero, Silverstein, August Burns Red, all these bands, you know, and, and Rich was just doing the Canadian side of things. But then it was very evident that we needed to change things up. And then Rich came into the fold and full time. And, uh, you know, I just wouldn't be able to execute without having somebody who's just so professional at listening to me just go ah, on a phone call and too, then too bad he's, he's not a woman man that would be someone to marry let me tell you <laughs> uh, honestly well you know I, I got a good one i got a good one too and uh, at heart i'm sure you know with this kind of stuff it's hard to get you know find that balance and and everything and um very on the same page and uh you know we're we're, we're a team because wouldn't have this space and everything that i'm doing now and like we really came together and collaborated um met actually just like just on the cusp of, of the pandemic um, oh that's cool man good for you everything and it's been a crazy year but i'll tell you if you can get to know somebody when there's like no you can't do material things eat in restaurants do stuff and you still like have that like you know every day is awesome you don't get tired of each other you know like you're gonna figure out very quickly that 
you know, when you take all the distractions and the fluff away, all, all the, yeah, the pomp and circumstance. Yeah. You'll, yeah. You'll, you'll be like, okay, yeah, no, for sure. Like I can, I can certainly, we can pull this off. So, um, no, it's been, been a crazy year. I mean, I'll t- you know, and I've had a few podcasts where I've, I've spoken to people, even some other, you know, uh, personalities and entrepreneurs and stuff that feel a little guilty that while a lot of people we know and people in, in, you know, in your, the proverbial, your life, um, aren't doing so hot with everything going, going on right now. And that's just a matter of circumstance. And trust me, I have the utmost respect and empathy for those people who have to go out there and do the things that make the world turn around right now. Um, individuals who, you know, the outliers who, who have passive e-commerce business set up, uh, to where they can use, these tools to do the things that that put food on the table what a time to yeah. be just you know um i was i did a podcast with my buddy finn mckenty for the punk rock mba and, and and finn talked about the black swan uh you know being sort of like a the black swan is like a metaphor for like the pandemic like you know being being prepared for for something like that. And, and inadvertently, I think that like the free thinkers and the creatives, like we're kind of ready for this. Like we're kind you know, but I will say, look, if I ever signed a recording contract or did anything where, you know, um, didn't solely own this operation, wouldn't be the same. Probably would have had to have figured some other stuff out, maybe teaching more, maybe having to get a job, maybe, you know, um, intervals is 100% independent. So, and that's sort of where I was going with that from the management side of things, like shout out to those guys, literally wouldn't be able to do what I do without the management side of things. But for listeners who are like, you know, in 2020 still thinking, Hey, when the world turns the lights back on, am I still like gunning for that recording contract? Am I look? it's like, I'll tell you, you're, you shouldn't be. And maybe depending on what you do, if, if, if you want the sky, maybe you do need the machine to put you there to, you know, you need that propulsion, but to, to make niche music for a fan base that is already cultivated. And there's a whole community around this stuff, you know, just using what I do as an example, instrumental guitar music, just make dope shit. Yeah. And, 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 and figure out what the, you know, the movers and shakers in, in our world are doing. Take a look at how they execute. Don't mimic, don't copy, but utilize the algorithm you know what i mean like figure out what works plug your personality and your coordinates and details and stuff into that and i promise if the product is honest and the art's there then you know you can you can do this and you don't need a label there's no more gatekeepers no now like spotify went through the roof all of our other revenue streams went through the roof this year has been i think this is where the guilt part comes in where I'm like I talk to people and I it's like how you how you doing it's like I felt like a crazy person with my head down making a record I was worried that releasing an album this year maybe would be not the best but then we've weighed the pros and cons and we realized you know if 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 the goalpost on touring keeps moving further and further into the new, the new year is it really fair to starve all of our fans for, for music, we owe them a release. I want to put it out. I need to keep moving. Well, you also become less relevant is the reality of it, especially nowadays. So you have to for your sake and for the fans. Especially when everyone's on Twitch every day and everyone's doing these and like you have to be able to do that. And, and, and while I do love a good PR run and this is probably like the last, funny enough, we scheduled your podcast first like at the top of our whole PR campaign, like weeks ago. And it was so funny, like actually probably like months ago, it was like two yeah. months ago. And it was so funny. We were talking about it, like when everything was coming together on the calendar and I'm like, on, like November, like we're in September and we're scheduling stuff. Are you serious? Like this guy's a big deal. Damn. Um, no, it would just, I, I've just been fortunate and like, I'm super organized and I'm, I'm, I'm always yeah. of the mindset. I'd rather have, you know, uh, shows in the bank so to speak than like live week to week like holy shit i got nobody i'm not i'm just not and i've been very fortunate with the growth of the corner of the show no it's amazing so um it's it's nice to i mean we're kind of wrapping up here with the pr run and stuff and i'm always down to do more of course and you know um i'm in a new space now it's very uh, yeah that's a very zen space there you got me i like the plain i like the lines clean lines white walls it's well yeah but except these white walls sound horrendous so that's 
I actually have a consult coming up for a treatment. <laughs> runs a company called Harbor Acoustics and he, he, he owns a studio called Union Sound Company. And uh, Leon's going to come and sort me out. I got a rug right. showing up maybe today or tomorrow, get the floor handled and then uh, some bass traps and some panels up, maybe hang a cloud. Um, I vibed it out last night with some Philips Hue strips along the back of the old desk here. Got the AZ Studios sit stand vibe. Finally got all my toys out. You do have all your toys. Out. Hey, look, let's... My, yeah. This is a good time. Let's talk about gear for a couple of minutes, about the guitar specifically. Uh, like, what is your go-to guitar right now, and what other two guitars would round out your top three? Yeah, so um, I've been playing Mayona's Guitars, which is a Polish um, company. It's, uh, What's the name of it? M Mayona's. M-A-Y-O-N-E-S. Okay. It looks like mayonnaise, but it's, yeah, Mayona's. Yep. Um, and unbelievable company from Gdansk, Poland. They're just legends all of them and um they make incredible modern custom semi-custom instruments um very partial to their regius um silhouette and uh we started off with with the those it's like that sort of jd green one that you see me with often um can, we, you, can you have one you have you want to pull one out yeah we can start not, that. yeah man i'd like to check that thanks So, Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So, so those are seven strings. This is a six, and uh, a six. I have I have a guy that's that's purple, and it's the same anatomically, except it's got an ash body and a fixed bridge, and it's the seven string counterpart. So the this guitar and the purple one that I'm describing were the first two that they made me. Um, this is their Regius Core model. So they do three takes on the Regius, Regius being the silhouette, and then okay. they do a core, which is this like really aggressive bevel and carve, and then they do a core classic, which is like a little bit softer. Um, it doesn't have the uh, ABS binding or the perloid binding. They do a natural binding on that one. These guitars are neck through design um which oh, wow. not, which is not 100 percent my preference and uh i'm tr without being fully cryptic like we've been working on something that is a little bit more in line with looks like this more in line with my preference i'm a bolt-on guy so um what don't you like what do you prefer bolt-on over the, the through the body what is it like aesthetic what is it aesthetics or just like what the immediacy of the of the the snap and the resonance like if you, stack a, if you stack up a, you know, it's like you take a Strat, you take a PRS, and you take like a, oh, what's an iconic neck through? I don't know, like an ESP or something like that. And what you'll notice is you get that immediacy from the Strat. You get that really quick, very fast response. PRS, somewhere in the middle, set neck design, got a deep tongue that runs through you know, right into the neck pocket. And some, I, th I think theirs might even go under the neck pickup or it gets pretty close, but a set neck is going to be, it's still two pieces and, but they're joined. It's a ju it's a, it's a glue joint. So, right. and the neck through, there's a couple things that happen. You do, there is a, a definitely a, a thicker sort of like width to the tone. And there's like a, definitely more of like a, a chewy like a bigger kind of gooier kind of sound but it's not necessarily as as quick you have to do things to make it so action definitely needs to be dialed so you get that mechanical snap out of the instrument pickups for sure the bridge material the weight of the body the materials i find that really really starts to play in when you do the neck through so we did mahogany body and these are an 11 ply laminate neck. You can't actually see. You can kind of see the stripes here. The light's a little funky in here because all I have on is that hue lighting from my desk. But I like the black, though, it's really cool looking, to be honest. Yeah, so we, we did go with this gothy kind of like murdered yeah. kind of vibe and then just like this kind of jady, greeny, teal kind of vibe with black perloid binding. Um, so with it being a neck through, there's a couple things. Really love the way this guitar sounds and records. Love the way it plays, of course. But it's a little heavy. Uh, okay because there's so much neck running through the body. Also where a bolt-on shines is because you can really dial in the weight of a neck and you can dial in the weight of a body and you can get that instrument to weigh in total what you want it to. Also, if anything happens and the touring world is crazy, especially with flying and stuff, if something happens to a body or a neck, bolt a new one on. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you can't, yeah. can't do that. This thing gets banged up, it's done. It's so, done. Yeah, uh, good point. 
love these bare knuckle pickups. Um, go to 510. Um, yeah, just a workhorse. This one's in drop D. Then, like I said, I got the purple one. It's a seven string. It's got a Schaller Hannes bridge on it and an ash body. Just responds a little different than the mahogany. I like mahogany on six because it's, you know, I don't need to be as tight in the bottom. I can get that from pickups and then I can be a little thicker, uh, have a little more width and mid range in, in the lead voice. But when it comes to the seven string, the compromise there with the ash as well might be a little thinner on some of the leads. And of course, you can always dial that. I need that snap in the bottom end. I need the guitar to ring like a bell when it's you know and nice and tight when it needs to be and full also when it needs to be the problem with this music is you're asking for the sky from your guitars because you want to be delicate and subtle and you want to have chimey split coil tones and all this delicate nice edge of breakup shit but then you also need to go full tilt balls to the wall it needs to be huge but tight and it needs to be it's like the you know the classic like you 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 see your tech and it's like i need my action to be you know as low as it can but no buzz and da, da, da. <laughs> you, you need too many things yeah. Guitars have to be extremely reliable. So we are working on something that remedies some of the things that I'm talking about, and that should hopefully be arriving uh, soon. And then um, I have, I'll show you one more. This is something yeah. that uh, arrived uh, maybe two months ago or so, and it's in uh, one of the most recent playthroughs. So people have seen this. I'll show you that one sec. Yeah, thanks. <sighs> So this is the Aquila model, also from Mayonas. And it resembles, in terms of its silhouette, it resembles, you know, more of a super strat kind of thing. Beautiful. I like the uh, quilting on that, man. Insane quilt top. Yeah, yeah this is pretty, one they, pretty they, color, they, man. They surprised me with this one. Um, this guitar anatomically is a little closer to sort of what I'm after. You can see the bolt on, roasted swamp ash body. So this has been kiln baked. So this, the same way you get, you see like a, you know, like a roasted maple neck or something, sort of that torrified treatment to the body yeah. it gives it, reduces a little bit of weight and just makes the whole thing ring like a bell. Very loud acoustic instrument, very snappy. And then quarter on wenge neck on this thing. So this is more of the, in the exotic sort of yeah. um, ebony Be board. Beautiful guitar. Man, you should be, uh, if you ever have a problem playing music, you'd be a great gear salesperson. You're like so specific and so like passionate about the, every the, the grain the 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 trees the wood you're perfect with this and i'm just listening i feel like i'm getting like because i'm a marketing guy i feel like i'm getting like a really good sales pitch here i'm like yeah i'll buy where's a, where's a link <laughs> you, you take uh, paypal <laughs> well, i did uh work music for three years and and i and i sold guitars alongside the guy who sold me my first electric guitar which is funny Shout do, out to do you still have your sg I don't have the SG anymore, really? but I do have the Strat. I do okay, have cool. My, my dad has is in possession of the Strat. Yeah, cool. Um, That's yeah. so weird that uh, you'd be playing an SG because I, I I loved my SG, but I just had to get rid of it. I couldn't get the uh, you know the 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 neck is neck dive. I didn't know what I didn't know. And it was like, we wanted, I think School of Rock had come out at the time. And it was so iconic. Great, and it was great like, sound. It's the oh, great. SG rocks, man. And like so many of my like bands I was listening to at the time, Anti-Flag and everyone was playing SGs. Thrice playing SGs. Um, love that. But not the most ergonomic or functional. Guitar. No, it's not. And what did you call it? Anatomical. I have not heard anybody refer to it as anatomical. That's a good, I like that, man. So... Yeah, so uh, this guy just resembles like more of the, the Super Strat kind of vibe. And it's something new that they came out with at NAMM. And they, they debuted this guitar with a pick guard. I have one in the pipeline that's coming like that. Mm. Kind of murdered out with a black pick guard and like a black flame maple top. Same body, but we're doing a maple board and maple neck. Um, is that ebony or rosewood? It looks so dark. This is ebony. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. I love ebony necks. Which oh, is this. more than snap, especially on a wenge neck, which is a little bit darker and chewier and thicker. When you do wenge with the bolt on and then you do the ebony board, you get a really nice response out of the guitar. I'm also really into just roasted maple neck with an ebony board. Yeah. Totally fine too. But they, they put this one together and surprised me with it. And it's just a bit of Beautiful. an exotic take on a super strat. Absolutely love it. Beautiful this. guitar, man. And then uh, I've got an Abasi uh, 7, Jay Lurata. Shout out to my, my buddy Tosin. Love those guitars as well. Um, it's just getting uh, 
uh, little tech work right now, so it's not around, but I used that a lot on the, the new album. Um, used my Regis guitars. And uh, I've got a, a couple of my Sirs left over. I worked with the company for a while. Um, I've got uh, two Moderns and a Classic Antique uh, okay. that I love as well. I've got a Gunmetal Gray um, Modern with a Floyd and a Reverse Headstock. It's a sick guitar. I've got Bare Knuckles in that one too. And then uh, my like standard workhorse modern that i played for ages and um and then i've got uh, yeah classic antique which is the first guitar i got from sir um seafoam classic antique strat vibe with a humbucker in the bridge really really nice and the only other strange like weird stuff that's in here that uh, guitar wise that uh is probably notable is i got a gretsch 30 inch baritone six string that was a surprise what do you do with that thing it's in a flat drop a flat it's the same like as our seven string tuning but it's missing a string and it's got these big big ass strings on it but it plays real nice so filter shines on there or? it's like yeah but it's, i mean it's not a u.s one it's just an offshore guy but i just okay. i saw my buddy rabia made a video reviewing the gretsch baritone and i played a baritone telly at a session that i did for a friend recently the guy had a the producer had a baritone telly around that they used on like a bunch of the early three days grace stuff and i played that guitar and i went that's cool let's get that so i ordered the gretsch um just as like a little birthday treat to myself it's just an offshore guitar it's nothing crazy i bought it on reverb um Reverb is like cocaine. It's, cool. it's like cocaine, man. It's, it's like a problem. Trust me, it's a problem. Do you want to follow this listing? And it's like it's like yes, yeah. follow. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I got uh, I got that, and that's been really fun to mess with. Just an inspiration machine, just something to kind of putz around. Cool, man. Um, and then uh, yeah, a few few mayos in the in the pipeline. Um, that new Aquila, something we're working on. I'd like to do one of their Duvel seven strings, which is a little bit more like metal kind of like, I just want to get one of those in the, in the collection. And, um, these fancy little cases just showed up from our friends at quantum oh, nice. trees. They're beautiful. Yeah. It's a Hong Kong company between Hong Kong and Japan. Um, shout out to Lee and Jackal, their band opened for us in Hong Kong. This was literally a conversation in a green room in 2018. And now this is a, this is the product for triple guitar cases. Um, literally was just a conversation. They didn't even exist. And then Jackal had the prototype at NAMM earlier this year and now they're full tilt worldwide shipping these things are sick i was just waiting for the new space so i could get them over here and you know get some new guitars in them so this will be what i tour with i've got two of them there so that's six guitars in there and then a little collection of amplifiers things that i've acquired along the way i got my axe effects mounted up and just a little kind of thing to make it look like an amp here it's not in the desk um and I've got a Boss a Wazacraft uh, tube amp expander that I, I run all these guys to so I can go line level uh, speaker into the, the Waza and then I can go line level into my Apollo. Um, you know, the majority of the pedals that I own, there's still a board that has some stuff and a few other things as well, but I've got them out and I've never been able to just like pedal library. I've got them arranged by type, not by brand. So I can go, I need an overdrive. I need a delay, right. whatever, and I can grab them. I've got a Strymon volante and a night sky chained up on my desk and they're hardwired to the output from my moog subsequent 37 so i've got some synths that you can't see here but i've got a moog and uh, there's a roland system 8 here um which is about to become a sequential profit six and that'll be here in a couple of days and uh, still keep the system eight. i love it I, I made a bunch of sounds for the record with it but because the way the system eight works it's like a plug out synth so you can actually take the soft synths from your daw and you can put them in the hardware roll and just send me an 88 key um uh a88 mark ii which is their big flagship 88 key weighted piano controller i have it in the desk i don't know if you can see no you probably can't, no, see, it, I can't see, I, see it i have it in the desk and it's yeah it's amazing so i can control all my soft synth so the system it becomes a little redundant i need a poly stereo analog synth that can stand up against the moog because the moog is just a just a mono synth but it's so enormous that it just swallows everything in the mix around it so i need like big giant wide poly stereo synth that i can uh you know stack up against the moog so it's been really fun to like mess with the synths i play what i can and if not i draw the midi and fire it out out of logic at the synths and i double my lines and embellish my stuff and that's kind of my rig basically <laughs> i don't know if you're happier with your equipment or with your aesthetics of your physical surrounding your the the pride you have about that i could hear that in your voice man well i've never had a space where i could put all my stuff out i just don't this is so new dude i'm yeah. like 
literally seven days ago, I got into the space. I put a bunch of work in. Yeah, I did a lot, good, a lot of work in seven days. Yeah, thanks, man. I just <laughs> wanted to get it together and feel like I can just hang out and zen out a little bit. And free time right now is just learning some synthesis and taking some piano lessons, playing guitar, get, trying to get better at mixing. Got to treat this room before I can understand what I'm hearing in here. It's just freaking brutal in here, but we're going we're gonna to get that sorted soon. So, Give me your top three Desert Island discs. Oh. Just for right now, like for today, that obviously oh. and does change all the time. Oh, my God. Um, I'm so bad at this. Okay. I'm going to be as rapid fire as I can. Um, top three Desert Island discs. Immerse by Pendulum. Artist in the Ambulance by Thrice. And um, Exile and Oblivion strung out. This is, this is, I've been missing so many integral records that of course. I that I could probably get by on those. Get the thrashy punk stuff, a little bit more like the heart post hardcore. And then some just like full tilt, hot, glossy HD, like drum and bass, electronic <laughs> shit. Fuck yeah. All right. Uh, what do you like most about yourself, Aaron? Oh, that's a weird question. Uh, I know it is. It's a hard question for most people. Uh, just, uh, nah, that's the, I don't know. I'm going to, this is the one that stopped you dead in your tracks, man. Oh, no. That feels weird to talk about. Um, ooh, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Just ability to trust intuition. That's a good one, man. Ability to trust intuition. That's important. Yeah. Uh, do you have any non-musical superpowers? Um, got really into like, oh, superpower though. No, um, oh, geez, I'm so bad at everything else. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was a nervous laugh. Uh, oh, I don't know about superpowers, man. I don't know. I used to be really good at gaming, but I haven't done that in a really long time. So it's just, I don't know, I'm just kind of one track, one track Timmy with the music, I guess. I don't know. You know what? Uh, I want to ask you about fitness. What, uh, yeah. I, I, you know, in your, all your, I didn't even know anything about your, I just, when I was looking at all your photos, I could just tell, I said, man, this guy must be into fitness or working out because your body, you're always, the way you're moving, you could just tell you're in shape. Um, you always had Nike, you always had Nikes and like gym clothes <laughs> on them. Not like, you know what I mean? Not like you're performing in your gym shorts, but like, you know, I'm like, that's how I would dress, man. You know, yeah. when did you start? You got and started to get into fitness after you had your surgery? A mm, little while after too. That was 2015. So I started to take it seriously in 2018. What do you do? Well, um, what do I do in a pandemic? Uh, cry because the gym is closed. Oh, the gyms are closed uh, there. Oh, dude. Oh yeah. Yeah. We had no gym for like 16 to 18 weeks. I lost so much progress. I tried to stay on home workouts and stuff, but I also needed to make a record and it was so challenging just living in the same room, like my previous space yeah. that like there was only so much mental bandwidth daily. And I was doing my sure. best, like my baseline was like 10 to 12,000 steps a day, at least just to get the just to keep the metabolism kind of, you know, working, just walk after meals and stuff like that. Yeah. A couple of home workouts, but it sapped the life out of me just staring at the freaking floor in the carpet or listening to a podcast and just like, you know, clicking together dumbbells from the trailer that I pulled out of my storage unit because it was just depressing. I lost a lot of progress. It's, it's, it's something I'm really bummed about, but I did actually take the opportunity to, uh, when things started to fire up again, um, uh, physio and chiropractic to actually fix some foundational and structural problems that were, uh, I was probably plateauing on certain things in the gym because shoulder impingement from being a guitar player, tight hamstrings from just never stretching when you're younger, like all kinds of weird, like, you know, tight hips from always sitting with a guitar, you know, this and that, and just trying to fix those things up, fix my forward head carriage with my neck, all that stuff. So that I can, you know, comfortably put a barbell on my shoulders again and, you know, not feel pain when I do train and things like that. So, um, 
And check out this guy online. His name is Tom Morrison. If you don't know him from the UK, because wow. I have so many, yeah, I have so many of those shoulder impingement issues, oh, and I've been God. doing his. Well, no, mine is just from years of I had I had bad posture, and I also bought this like it's like a man bra. It's like a posture thing. And uh -oh. it, Did that work it, for you? Oh my God, I wear it like an hour a day, and oh, yeah. it is dramatic. Okay. Yeah. And but watching Tom's videos, he made this one comment on there and he just said something about the way uh, the walking or and I don't hunch over anymore, man. That was a killer for me. But I've talked to so many guys with shoulder impingement from guitar playing. I would encourage I, I started doing his exercises at my son's because my son's in mobility. He said, look at this guy. And he told me some stuff. And man, it has really helped. It, yeah, it, for sure. I know I, I back all that stuff. I have a there's a sports nutrition and um, physiotherapist that I work with here in the city. He works with the the Leafs and the Raptors and stuff. Oh, like cool. He finds me to be a very interesting case study because a musician's body is like, he, he actually compares funny enough, uh, guitar playing, um, like what it does to your posture and the like lasting effects of that. He compares it to goalie hockey goalie. I'm not surprised. I've talked to so many guitars with this man twisted hips one knees on the ground so like the pelvis is always out of whack and then the shoulders are super cocked and out of whack and the neck's messed up because you're te you're holding tension you know you're trying to brace for things um yeah it's it's definitely something you need to be active but when i was you know f full tilt training and feeling really good and the gym was available and i could be you know in a dialed in regiment um just like a standard split, um, maybe a little bit of Metcon type stuff where it's like, I'll do a full body and try to keep the pace up and, you know, program something where it's like, you know, pull ups into the trap bar and some push ups and some kettlebells and some step ups and then just like run that until I'm a disaster and then finish off with some other stuff. Um, or I'll do like a bro split upper lower or like a legs push pull a bro split. I've never heard that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Whatever. But like, bro it's been split. really challenging. My, um, my girlfriend works in a physiotherapy clinic and she's in her last year of, she's actually writing an exam. Uh, she's in her last year of kinesiology and she's going to major in, you know, specialize in physio. And so it's interesting because we kind of meet in the middle on that. And uh, I'll tell you what's something that really changed, uh, helped me in the last little while as I was experiencing some all kinds of messed up stuff with one of my legs and is coming from, from tight hips, tight hip flexors and some, you know, some issues. Um, I did this, uh, 15 minutes a day for 21 days, like gravity yoga type thing, Whew, challenging, but wow, fixed a lot of problems just in 21 days, just through 15 minutes of, of, you know, the right stretches and just like, it's three, three poses per session. It's five minutes per pose guy walks you through it. Um, that was huge for me. So I like I've, my mobility is feeling pretty good. I'm very excited to train, but they took the gym away for 18 weeks. We got it back in the summer. Then they took it away, gave it back for like two weeks. And then we hit this holiday wave that's going on and everything. And we're technically on lockdown again, actually it, it should be lifted, uh, December 20th, but they're watching the numbers. Um, Canada is taking it very seriously. Ontario is taking it really seriously. A couple of mistakes here and there, but um, honestly, we had our numbers really low in the summer. And then, you know, when the schools came back and the weather got colder, yeah. it started to creep up again. So yeah, still no gym. I just moved into a building that has a wonderful gym and I can't use it. Um, so it's just like, you know, some body weight stuff when I can and just to feel like I'm not doing nothing. But the plan would be when things kind of, start to look a little bit more consistent and the, and the ability to train comes back. Um, I'll probably team up with one of my trainer pals again, or I'll just start to just ease back in, uh, jump on. Oh, you have to, cause you go in and you can't, you're not going to be able to lift what you lifted. Trust me. Oh, I, I wasn't. Yeah. I also hurt my leg as a result. Cause I was doing some hip openers and stretching. And then I put some weight on that trap bar and, piriformis, uh, glute, deep six, hamstring scenario did not like that. I was I had tight hips from, you know, from, um, sitting all year. Hence I got the sit stand desk. <laughs> I had to fix a bunch of stuff. I, I ordered a Herman Miller. Look so, at you. Oh, yeah. I got architectured it, out. Yeah, man. I do it, you know? So, and now's the opportunity to, you know, the records out, it's doing great time to make more music time to just enjoy no deadlines and just we don't know when touring is coming back so i'm going to try to get ahead of myself collaborate with some people make some more music vibe out with just no expectations and i want to be comfy and and feeling good when i do it so i'm going to ask you a couple more questions and i want to talk about the record cool. uh 
toughest decision you've had to make or most difficult thing you've had to do? Um, probably leaving my, oh, toughest decision and hardest thing I had to do, uh, psyching myself up to have surgery. Yeah, I'm sure. And knowing for a year that you're on a wait list for an elective procedure and having it described to you and thinking every day about what they're going to do to you in a year and having to live with that. I didn't realize there was a lot. Yeah. That's gotta be torture, man. Waiting. Semi-conscious. During yeah. The as well. yeah. You said that that's 90 minutes took four hours. Wow. Your perception of time is completely off. They give you the good shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know, it's not, not pleasant. I mean, you're, you're on a giant magnetic table while they manually pace you and they're in control of everything and they're inside you <laughs> and then they have to cauterize a spot shut and they're talking to you while it's happening but you're completely out of it you feel a lot of pressure in weird places and stuff moving around inside you and wow katie perry's on the radio and you're like, what the fuck is going on <laughs> you should have uh, bought it should have bought some you bought at least bought some good music it's funny here. <laughs> you want a funny story I, mean, I feel like you're a guy who appreciates comedic irony so i, I wake up and uh, the riff from the first song on The Shape of Color, I'm Awake, is like rolling around in my head. It ended up being the first song that I, I ended up composing. But we, uh, we wanted to, to, to have a, um, a unique premiere partner for that release. And we decided to really kind of try to branch out on that one. So Brett had, you know, and our PR team had reached out to some, some of the not so usual suspects. And, uh, you know, not usual being like not Guitar World, not Revolver Magazine, not Alternative Press, like any of that stuff. Uh, and Red Bull Music came back and was like, yeah, we totally want to premiere the song and do an article and da-da-da. So we, I'm just going through the motions yet. Like, this is so sick. Like, there's a lot of artists that work with Red Bull that I think is really cool. And they, like, wrote an expose and a piece and, like, a story about, like, the song and, like, you know, the riff rolling around in my head after emerging from, like, surgery and da-da-da. And I realized, like, I'm looking at the Red Bull site and I'm reading about a heart condition on a energy drinks website. And I'm just like, <laughs> you know, obviously disclaimer it didn't come from drinking too many Red Bulls, but I just thought it was so funny to like, I'm like, yeah. like morbidly. <laughs> oh man, that's okay. So at least you got a partner though. That was good. I know it sounded like oh. a really enthusiastic one. That is kind of funny though. So yeah, totally cool. And we're always down to team up with different people and stuff. Um, to do some stuff like that. We did a little less of that this campaign. We did, we just work with Guitar World and we self premiered a bunch of stuff, but I think we're at a level now where I, I almost feel better about just self premiering. So you're good at it, man. I don't mean that in the back. I mean, you're very comfortable promoting yourself, which is great, you know? And, I, and unfortunately, as I feel a that way here, but I, I just, you know, you just get used to no, it. No, but you're, I'm telling you, you're comfortable speaking about stuff like that. That's a, a gift because most musicians, unfortunately, are not, and they really need to in today's day. It is unfortunate, yes, because yes, you you are your company and you represent it. And and I was, for me, I just feel like I represent me in the music, but I we were talking about the team before. Like I'm literally thinking about like my merch guy, Justin, and I'm thinking about like my bus driver, Greg, and you know, I'm thinking about my front of house engineer, Chase, like when I'm talking about the music and us and represent, like, I don't, it's not just about me. Like it's all of us, you know? Yeah. But you don't have to, I don't think people are thinking that. No, no. I just, you know? it's going on and that's yeah. the, the dialogue or the narrative that's happening in my yeah. head. Like, watch what you say. Cause everybody's got to eat. You know what I mean? It's like, no, I think I just thought you, you did a good job at it. And at, at a young age, I think it's good. And it's probably going to serve you very well. Well, because I have guys come on here and I'll be like, what can I, you know, first thing I say, uh, thank you for coming on the show. What can we promote at the end? And people, oh, I don't know. I don't really, I'm like, don't you have a new record? I'm like, well, I guess we could talk. I'm like, fuck, it ain't going to sell. It's not going to promote itself. I mean, you know, no, I know. So, I mean, you have I don't to like peddling things. stuff, man. I don't like peddling stuff. My fans know I don't push merch all year long. I don't, I just gear up for these campaigns. We just go full tilt for like six to eight weeks and then trickle some content out. But you know, we just, just do what we have to, when we have to, I don't ever want to annoy anybody. I don't want to be, you know, the overzealous guy. Yeah, sure, man. You know, you know, and it's been, it's a delicate time because everybody's vying for that attention right now. And then you right now, yeah, you're like pan absolutely. pandemic social media starving artist attention scenario coupled with like corporate holiday, you know, 
Amazon, Coca-Cola, you know, buy discounted rugs, whatever is coming up in your new, it's like, there's no room for yeah. anything. I'm so glad I got the record out ahead of the election and ahead of the holiday rush and everything. Like we strategically planned for that. So and I want to talk about one, one more question. Most important lesson you've learned in life, either from your business or from life in general. Whew. Um, wow. Damn, you got the good questions, man. Uh, <laughs> we could talk about string gauge if you prefer. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Stretch your strings. Before- <laughs> guitar, that's the big life lesson. Um, that is important. Wow, wow, wow. Life lesson. Honestly, I think it really is to just do what fulfills you and what makes you happy and what defines you. Um, it's a long one, but it's also a short one. So, you know, at the very same time, you know, it's like you feel like you have all the time in the world and then all of a sudden you snap out of the fever dream and you're like, oh man, I'm, I'm, I'm here, wherever that is. And, uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta ask yourself, like up until now, have I been doing what makes me feel, you know, like me? And if the answer is no, then you need to fix that because there's so much like dissonance of the mind and the soul that comes from not, you know, and I, and, and unfortunately like a lot of people that I know uh, that I've just met in passing or people in my life, like they don't know, you know, and you can, it, it you see it in their, the way they talk about things or, you know, how they behave and like you can feel that there's like something like there's like two cables just hanging like this that just need to be you've got to just get them together and like the lights would really turn on you would be fully animated you know not just half a robot you'd be a real boy you know <laughs> <laughs> so you know it's like just that because i personally i i just know myself well enough to know that if i wasn't if i didn't have the ability to just be how I want to be, I'd be a basket case. So you need to create a set of circumstances that allows you, and you need to build an environment that allows you to just be who you're meant to be. Um, so, you know, and, and, and I think that good plays into what we were talking about before about trusting your intuition. You need to listen to that and then allow that to dictate, you know, um, whatever. You're, what, yeah. You're good about being connected to yourself. And that's not something that a lot of people that everybody can do. It's, it's something that you have to work up to for a lot of people, but you've been, you're good at that. So good for you, man. Well, thanks man. At a young age too. I recognize it in me, but that's also because I've seen it in others that I care about and realized that maybe, you know, a given relationship or certain things didn't work out between individuals because they, don't have that and you can't force that on somebody and it's their journey but the sad thing is that if you don't know who you are it's really challenging to have relationships with somebody who does that's there's a very strong dichotomy between an individual who's driven has purpose um and somebody who hasn't figured it out yet and I've been in situations where you want to help somebody um, find that um, and there's no amount of doing things for them or trying to create circumstances. You just know it's not going to work that way. And um, there's a whole set of mental gymnastics that happen between two individuals, but that aren't on the same wavelength. So, you know, you're either going to be two people who don't know and you can figure it out together and that's a beautiful thing or you're going to be two people who do know and completely mutually exclusive separate interests and all kinds of, but it's about purpose it doesn't matter what it's why and you have both have to have why because if 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 one doesn't the other one's insecure about that and you know it's hard to have a balanced relationship and I'm not even just talking about between like, you know, like a platonic, like, you know, like partners, like, you know, you know, between uh, like that kind of scenario, friendships, all kinds of stuff. If there's resentment, weird stuff going on because somebody hasn't figured out and the other one doesn't and they're struggling with their things, it's really challenging. So I think that the biggest thing that allows you to have like meaningful 
like, you know, meaningful relationships in your life and interface with every single person that you meet, somebody at the store, you know, yesterday morning or the person you'll meet later or a family member or just anybody in your life, having you figured out allows you to just be, and then everything that comes and goes, you know, it's going to work or it's not on account of what they have going on. You know, it doesn't absolve you. You still have to do the work, but at least, you know, there's no dissonance internally and you can just, you just know with peace, like in security that you're who you're meant to be and that you're okay with that. And it's going to go how it's going to go from there. So. Dude, I like what you said. Everything you said was great. You still have to do the work. That was awesome. Um, Hey, listen, let's talk about your uh, last record, Circadian. Uh, Beautiful cover. Great record, man. Hang on a second. My mouse. I got the record right here. Oh, I'm holding it the wrong way. There you go. Uh, Now everything's gone. Okay. (laughs) Now, you know, does that ever happen to you when your mouse, like the, it just stopped like you got a blow on it and it just stops work. Okay. Now I got it. My uh, it to me all the time. I hate it. Like it's awful, man. Eight songs. Great. I like the, the opening track. That was my favorite five HTP, but Thank talk. You. Yeah, man. And cool cover, man. Who did that? Yeah. So that's Colin um, from circus survive. He's one of two guitar players in the band circus survive. He's a unbelievable artist. And yeah. he and I had a couple uh, funny enough. I did his podcast earlier in the year we had a conversation that definitely led to me understanding that he was very much on the same wavelength uh, and, and could carry out the uh, sort of the vision that I had, which is, you know, um, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a lot, there's a lot to unpack in terms of like the metaphor uh, that I'm sort of. Um, Is there any drugs involved? Cause that's what that thing looks like. Man. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there's definitely like some hints to some stuff. Like, <laughs> colors in the brain are like sort of our way of sort of depicting like neurotransmitters. Um, there's four colors in the brain and it's like, you know, the track seven is dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, endorphins. That's what dose stands for. That's oh, okay. And five HTP is the precursor to serotonin. Right. I know that yeah. I knew that yeah. I knew that's so funny, man. Yeah. And then like the little rings around the guy, like the subject on the cover yeah. are mycelia. So that's, this sort of like an allusion to like microdosing psilocybin. You're a deep guy, man. Uh, I mean, I've, I've been, the last couple of years I've been getting into some stuff. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Talk about the record, man. Yeah, sure. So yeah. Um, circadian is a, is a metaphor for, um, you know, it's a constant, uh, this, this theme or idea of like striving for like balance, uh, which is so funny that we're just talking about all the things that we're talking about. It's it's evident in my, you know, the literary sort of side of the music um, and the stories I'm trying to tell. It's like, you can tell it's something that's on my mind. Uh, and it started, read a lot, by, right? What's that? You're a big reader. Not as much as I probably should. I, I, I take in a lot of, it's like a lot of like, you know, you know um, information for sure. I love a good documentary or I do read in, in bursts, but. I don't mean like books, but you just seem to be someone like you, you, for example, you'll fit, you'll have an interest and you'll do a dive on the internet and absorb a bunch of stuff. Yeah. I'm trying to learn. Well, I le- I'm trying to learn every day. Like, yeah. I, right. Like, I have, I have time. So I'm always like watching something or learning about something. Um, but yeah, so the end of the shape of color was the finale. The final track was called Libra. And that was the beginning of me sort of starting to sneak in this like concept. I I was just dipping a toe with knowing that like the next couple bodies of work or whatever I do next is going to be rooted in this concept of, of striving for, for balance. Um, and, uh, my, myself, my father and my mother are all Libras or three Libras, which is funny. It's a perfect wild, but yeah, we're all, my mom's September 28th. My dad's October 5th and I'm October 6th on the day after him, which is really funny. That is wild. Uh, but yeah, so uh, started sort of teasing that there. And then the way forward was sort of a, it was an allusion to, uh, it was kind of like a, a bit of like a bit of an oxymoron in the sense that like, in order to like resolve the the past, it's like, you know, the way forward is like through sort of like putting the, the, the puzzle pieces in place and sort of like. It's very true finishing that yeah it's resolving those things um so 
a lot of stuff going on there. There's a bunch of Easter eggs between the front cover and the back cover. And, you know, we were using sort of like the, the archetypal like hero's journey to sort of you know, depict um, sort of what we were from a, from a visual standpoint, what I'm sort of referencing. You can see the Libra scales are hanging off the temple at the top or hiding them in places. And it's, it's, it's a thing for sure. A lot of people thought that was like some weird, like Illuminati Looking stuff. Looking at it right on. now. Yeah. Yeah. The way forward. Yeah. And if you see the front cover and the back cover, you'll notice that there's interplay between both of those covers. Um, so, you know, what I like, I like is that it's like it's an folded out al- old album. Yes. And fun- so, so Tim Grove, the artist for this particular project, that's Simon Grove, who plays bass with Plenty. Okay. Uh, Simon's brother, Tim, is an incredible designer from Australia. And he and I had these big, long conversations where it's like, I almost felt like he was my shrink. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we were, we were sort of, you know, creating this this world and this like, you know, this imagery to depict the story and what I'm trying to tell. So, or the message I'm trying to convey and, and there's a lot going on in there. Um, little things to find and the, yeah, the interplay between the front cover and the back cover. Um, but circadian was the first time that I had ever um, had the concept and the title and everything before the music. I, I always do the music and then title and you know, sort of identify and sort of uh, let the music sort of tell me what it wants to be called or whatever, you know, afterwards. But this is the first time I, I already knew um, that I wanted to use circadian, which is, you know, for those that don't understand, like circadian rhythm is like our relationship to the sun and the moon. And it's, it's, you know, it's ties in with like the farmer's almanac and it ties in with like, you know, our biological clock and, and, and everything. So um and any living organism has this circadian, you know, connection to the sun. So um, when you learn about biohacking and people don't understand that term, biohacking is, you know, tweaking your environment to, you know, bring you closer to nature so that like we can be the truest, you know, representation of ourselves or at least closer modern humans. Like, I mean, I live in a condo. It's not like I'm like sleeping with my feet buried in the soil. It's like, you know, it's like uh, biohacking also is just maximizing yes. your body. Your, you know, like you don't need to go to a doctor and get surgery for your shoulder. You can do mobility exercises. hundred percent. Yeah, yes. You know. Yeah. And I, and I've been to a bunch of weird stuff. I have like a, a infrared panel and, you know, like, Dude, Dude, that's try everything whatever floats your boat you know it might work it might not but if you don't try it you you'll never know if it's gonna work you know that was exactly. always exactly and i got really fascinated i love just learning about this stuff so a bunch of great resources of course um i did this thing once sorry i mean it was this was really weird uh tapping yeah they, they yeah, yeah yeah like for stress and Ocean i was tap, yeah i was tapping one time my wife goes what are you doing? I'm like, uh-huh. I'm trying this thing and I didn't work. It wasn't for me. I think when you do something that's going to work, you're going to have a connection. There's going to be some, um, you know, and, and that I didn't have that. And I was like, this is not my thing. Yeah. I think that might be the same category as like hypnosis. I think that you have to give yeah. yourself to the thing. I think yeah. that if you're, if the barrier is there, I don't think it's going to work. Um, but man, I mean, the body is fascinating. I mean, I, I, often have uh, am treated with electroacupuncture and you know lots of different things and like the nervous system is unbelievable like being able to just like you know uh, know these like points and various like things like pressure points and release yeah that breath work even breath work just modulating you know your your nervous system response your entire physiology just with breathing is unbelievable um before the pandemic and you know when things were a little bit more normal i was doing regular cold exposure like the what is that cold exposure being like um ice bath holy shit full full tilt like up to your neck like two you know like minus one minus two degree water how did that what was that like oh it's unbelievable it's the greatest thing that you could it's incredible people probably think that's nuts when they hear it but go check out like wim hof and ben greenfield yeah i've seen those guys that are like huge proponents for for cold exposure. So it's, it's, it's just like a sauna or anything. And you actually combine the two. So you go from the ice bath into the infrared sauna. Yeah. And the idea is it's hormetic stress, right? So it's short exposure to stress that strengthens the nervous system, but it has massive impact on all other aspects of your life as well, because it actually creates your ability to buffer stress 
emotional stress, not just physical stress, is actually enhanced by the nervous system response. It's actually toning your vagal response, being able to control your breathing and not let your stomach fly away on you and get your brain all in a tizzy and being able to actually control your breathing while ex- exposed to, I mean, we're talking about literally getting in a bath with ice. Um, okay. Yeah. So it's about high stress, controlled high stress situations and you slowing things down to adapt to them. And then the idea is then when you're in the real world and uh, you're in the same situation, you are able to slow things down. And yeah, yeah. I guess it's a matrix moment between you and stress. It's like, yeah. you know, fight or flight would kick the minute you find that there's no money in your bank account or the minute your girl says something you don't like <laughs> there's like this weird like the the room freezes and you're br- like you just think different you move slow through yeah. it. like it's almost like cbt enhanced like cognitive behavioral therapy that's just like built into the stress response it stops the nervous system from going immediately into fight or flight and it allows right like analyze in like this like slow motion anti-gravity sort of way where you notice like heart rate doesn't change breathing doesn't change you get a clear thought you get your head around what's happening and you react and like people in your life will tell you why are you so calm these days you're such a different right. person. it's amazing and it's like it's nothing to do with this like woo woo like oh i'm a buddhist and i take cold baths now and it's like you no know, it's it, it becomes built into the to the stress response because uh subconsciously your brain is like uh this is nothing <laughs> we did we did cold for two minutes and you were completely fine so this is nothing yeah. but it, there's more to it than that because it's kind of like the magic cure all it doesn't it's too good to be true when you list the benefits of cold exposure um and you only need two minutes by the way anything over that is just now it's just mental toughness all of the health benefits happen in two minutes so you get um heat shock protein and cold shock protein response which is just for cell autophagy and all kinds of crazy stuff in the body there's it's 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 amazing it's like the same benefits as like extended fasting or like you know these types of metabolic type things and then speaking of of the metabolic process of course the body now has to reheat itself after which really raises your your metabolism i found that when i was training consistently doing cold exposure and i had the diet dialed you could overeat on calories and they go to all the places that you want to go you get a nice full pump you don't feel like you're spilling over the scale's not changing you're eating more more energy for the workout it's like nutrient partitioning and metabolism becomes so efficient um and then of course uh cold exposure also converts white adipose tissue to brown adipose tissue, which takes visceral fat and actually prepares it to be burned in the next. Oh, uh, I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. Yes. And caffeine will enhance this. So if you do, so it's like, if you do like fasted in the morning with a cup of coffee and the cold exposure, you can do it in your shower too, you do, but it won't be as cold as the. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Not, a, not this, <laughs> not this oh, not guy. No? No. No, there you no, I like a nice hot shower I couldn't do the cold exposure stuff. I do other stuff to slow my thinking down but I, and i so i totally get it and support it that's just not for me yeah the physical stuff of course yeah no mindfulness will work for all that too physical benefits like leanest tightest like no, i had three kids that's what i did and i'm like you have to fucking learn how to slow down because you, you're you like pop if you, you don't yeah and you're like you're fucking kidding me so you can't do that you're like all right. And so I read a bunch. Seriously, man, this shit happens. And my son's, my oldest son's a year older, a year younger than me. But now, but I, and then I just started reading. A, and the, the thing that I did was I gave myself permission. This is what this one book taught me about when I was raising my kids. Too bad I read it my last one, not my first one. Um, it said, when your child does something, you feel compelled to like correct them. And then like when they're older, discipline them. They said, don't give yourself permission to not react right away. Cause as a parent, you think, Oh man, you're fucking not going out forever, you know, or something like seriously. If they do something bad enough, you're like, it's like all this shit. How can I punish them the worst? Cause they did so, but like, and I learned don't do anything. And I'm like, that was took like so much stress off me. And it's just like what you're well, CBT. That's cognitive behavioral therapy. That's allowing you to know, you know what? They, they don't know any better. They're just living their life. They don't have any of that experience or knowledge to, you know, there's nothing for them to weigh that against. So that's just a natural thing. You, you know, you have all that life experience, you know, how yeah. your dad feel when you did it or how you felt 
you know, it, but they don't know. So you have to like, and it'll, and it, yeah, and it saves you the stress too, which is like, yeah, it, that's about me on that one. Not I could, yeah, it was really not about them. It was like, no, how do, I, how do, yeah. you know, how do I manage my, this situation better for me? Whatever they did is done. I can figure out any kind of discipline in an hour or a day or three sure. days. Sure. And, but you're right. That is so important to do. It, it's going to put years back on your life. Oh my God. I'm like a different guy. Yes. It changed this, this whole, and this it's scalable. This, what we're talking about, it's not just about how you react to children. It's like your relationships. It's everything. It's yeah. situations. I mean, I used to be stressed out about all kinds of crazy stuff on tour. And then once, uh, I sort of started to change my mental, uh, you know, perspective on a lot of these things, like I remember being on our way into Florida and our bus broke down and we had to do some crazy maneuver to get all the gear into a crossload into a U-Haul and rent a vehicle to get the guys four hours down the road. And then a bus change off bus, new bus is coming from 14 hours away and we're stuck at a truck stop in fricking Tallahassee or something. And like, <laughs> you know, and I, I just, I'm like unfazed. I'm like, my guys are going to handle it. It's all good. Everyone yeah. here is hard. It's like, there's nothing to worry about. It's all good. Good. And, you know, but I used to tweak over stuff. So I'm trying to preserve, you know, myself. Well, it's good that you're doing it now at that young age, man, because it'll serve you the rest of your life. Yeah, you got to do that. I run hot anyway. So, like, I have to. <laughs> I run hot. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, man, no, the, 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 the stuff is, is, is crucial. And, like, we, we haven't even talked about, like, the mental benefits of a lot of this stuff. Like, you know, as far as, like, achieving the flow state and you know um being able to just enhance your focus um as far as like the nitty-gritty uh in terms of like supplementation and like the things that really help um for the brain for like mood management balancing your neurotransmitters like making sure the brain is firing correctly like there's some pillars that i can't live without um making sure you have a quality um, source of omegas in, in your diet is huge for your brain. I mean, fish oil, it's not just, you know, it's not snake oil, it's fish oil. And yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's crucial, you know, so uh, twice a day, beginning and the end of the day, it enhances sleep, but it also kicks the brain up, you know, up into the, the places that it needs to be for, in order to have like a uh, streamlined uh, cognitive um, uh, performance throughout the day but that's just one of them um huge proponent for all the mycelial um stuff so like these mushroom supplements you know it's like it's 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 hot you hear people talk about it all the time you know cordyceps and reishi and chaga and lion's mane and all these things but look the, these are truly nature's nootropics and brain enhancing and all and overall organ enhancing um and supportive uh um, you know, natural medicines, um, you know, they can't be patented by Pfizer, uh, or that's why, that's why nobody, that's why they always, you uh -huh. know, Oh, this is bullshit. But people can go listen to Paul Stamets talk about mycelial research on the Joe Rogan podcast or any of his other, you know, seminars. Paul Stamets uh, owns the company Host Defense. They're the biggest uh, North American company that grows uh, all these different mushrooms that I'm talking about. Um, Host Defense, um, Paul Stamets. And um, that's one of the first people I heard to actually talk about the Fatiman protocol, which is um, microdosing psilocybin on a regular basis, but a trace amount. So a non-psychoactive amount. So you're not getting high, you're not tripping out. Yeah. Uh, strategically working it into your regimen with the right supplements. So the Fatiman protocol is every two or three days, you take a trace amount of psilocybin with wow. lion's mane, which is lion's mane is the mushroom that's uh, uh, notable for neural neural so neurogenesis it's the it's the resheathing of your nerves and this gooey substance called myelin and myelin is what protects your nerves yeah. and and uh it's it goes from your brain all the way through your body um if people started uh with lion's mane in their 20s or late 20s uh the research shows that it's you're you will not be a candidate for alzheimer's or any of these things because that brittle snapping of the nerve uh and these like proteins that get all gunked up in your brain and stuff uh are what causes this and it's uh you know it's dietary um and it's just living hard and fast and not doing anything to fix these so if you can get uh, if you can actively get around it um you stand a chance to have a uh, you know better cognitive uh health um you know but also i'll tell you we're talking about mobility you know 
when you research um, microdosing uh, and what that does for, um, you know, the management of things like PTSD and, um, you know, stress, depression, anxiety, um, all 100%, I can tell you from the last year and a half or two years, it's unbelievable the impact, the profound impact that it has. And when you combine it with things like mindfulness, it changes who you are for the better. I promise that. But when we're talking about learning new motor patterns, retraining posture, trying to fix something like you've got a crooked foot all the time, you know, trying to get that leg back and, you know, make the hips change or make the shoulders change, change the neck, going through those mobility drills and stuff. When you are literally taking in uh, materials that help your body regrow your nerves. And, and, you know, for a long time, scientists said that the brain stops growing after a certain age and that we, you know, you're just done. It's so not true. I mean, I'm at a piano lesson yesterday and I'm learning scales and I'm doing things that are so foreign to me. And I wake up today and the motor pattern is there. Right. And I'm still strategically supplementing, of course. And, you know, it's been incredible. I, I, I don't rely on pharmaceuticals or anything to keep my mood and my everything, you know, about me in check. Um, you know, and it just allows you to, to, to get over stuff and resolve things and feel like you're constantly like focusing forward. I stopped ruminating and worrying about yesterday when That's I started. That's the most important thing, man. You can't grow forward if you're just constantly, you know, and it's, yeah, it's really interesting. So that type of stuff I'm very, very passionate about. And you can see it in the album cover and you can see it in everything that I'm talking about through the record and stuff like that, through the song titles and stuff. But it's funny that we got here from that conversation, but the overarching sort of concept with circadian is that it's a metaphor for balance, you know, that connection to, you know, the universe and to the sun cycle and everything is just that, like, it's just the Libra scales in a different way. I'm just giving, I'm just, it's a different way of thinking about that. And when you learn about becoming a balanced human and you realize how important that connection to the sun is and your sleep and all these types of things, that's when you find, you know, we'll never be perfectly balanced, but this is, these are the things that you do to strive to be as close to yeah. these things as possible. So it's what's on my mind. It's what, what I, you know, sort of baked into the record and aesthetically and to the song titles and everything. And, um, it's, it's just funny that you use the word baked. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, and, and that's the work too, man. Freudy, a Freudian slip. <laughs> uh, it's, no, it, it, it's totally, totally fine. I mean, hey, look, it's medicine here in Canada. Canada is legal there, right? Yeah. That's funny. Well, you know, down here, man. Uh, Where are you, by the way? I'm, I'm in Tampa. Oh, you're in Tampa. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Florida, they, good. They, they just made about a year ago legal for me it's like a it's a folding process first it's legal for medicinal purposes it, it, yeah it's, it's common though you'll, you'll oh yeah it should be i mean it's no no reason not to but um like now you know when i was younger i'm 57 this is a long time ago when i turned 21 you go out and have a beer now when you turn whatever the age is they go get their weed cards it's so funny <laughs> Yeah. And the thing is, is it was totally normal here for so long and they did it so late that it was just like, okay, cool. Like it was very yeah. anti-compactic. It's like, okay, yeah, we just buy it at a place that looks like the Apple store now. It's fine. It's like, it this is all these places. I went to, we were in Colorado where I was in, it was amazing. They're all like, started, yeah. I was like, holy. And I, I, I asked them, you know, like, what do you want? I don't like, I don't know. And they're like, well, how do you want to feel? I'm like, it's buzzed and they're like no 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 and i'm i'm like listen man there's this, more to it than that this is way above my pay scale man just you pick <laughs> you know I, I i'm not that educated here it was like we a barista actually, we played uh we played the marquee theater in denver on like the day the bill was passed oh my god I remember being there when you know, i was like and even still the city wasn't going crazy people weren't lined up and panicking for it or anything it's like cool we've been doing this you just buy it at the store now so yeah cool. um but yeah, that stuff, that stuff works too. I mean, it helps me flip my perspective every once in a while. I'm not too shy to talk about that. It's okay. It's not something I'm actively like promoting or condoning or anything. You're going to do what you're going to do. It's fine. But you Absolutely. know, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm into it. I mean, it, it certainly does help me like just, you know, I'll, I'll compose in both head spaces and one allows me like a check. Interesting. Like I, yeah, because when I sort of like hit a wall, like I love waking up and just like get some sparkling water and some coffee and just go, you know, fasted, just clear right into some work. Um, and then maybe, maybe burn out a little bit on that, or I need to just change my focus a little. So there's a couple of tools, cold shower in the middle of the day. It's a huge one. That'll, <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a really good one. Um, 
I swear that sounds crazy, but it's, 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 there are proven benefits. Like it changes your mood immediately refocuses you. Um, I try not to overdo the coffee and stuff like that. So, you know, I'm not trying to do the stimulants, but yeah, when I feel I'm going to pull a little, pull a vape out or something, you know, just yeah. get a little new. And then all of a sudden you're off to the races in a different direction or allows you to check what you now you're really excited about the thing you built this morning. You take it in a different direction. And then at some point you got to put it away, you know, maybe you come back to it later and you check it out. But it's like, for me, it's almost like the creator, listener, creator, listener, Interesting. Like toggle between. Yeah. So it's I'm it like certainly works. I'm like completely useless. <laughs> oh, I, I, I would do nothing stoned because I'm oh, useless. I, I feel that way. I get really like micro with the when I'm in the grips of a you know that vibe. Oh yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll sink like three hours into a riff. I'm not composing or arranging. For <laughs> I do that like clean in the morning with some coffee and some sparkling water. And I just like review the mess I made from yesterday. I like <laughs> pieces in isolation. And then I have like a macro, micro, macro, micro kind of vibe. Holy shit. It takes a lot of energy to be Aaron Marshall. Let me tell you right now, I'm exhausted. Just listen to your routine, man. <laughs> I mean, routine man cat. I, yeah. I don't know. I just try to like, I don't know. It feels pretty easy on this end, but I just no, you're you know. living life, man. Yeah. And it's, you know, and it's just such a crazy time to talk about this. Like, I feel so grateful, like so thankful to be able to like have a, a discussion about like all of the good and, you know, from my vantage, like I'm able to fill my day with things that I don't, it doesn't feel like vacuous and and empty and void and, you know, nebulous, like because of everything that's going on. In fact, it's like, okay, well time to get in the dojo. You know, because yeah, man. when the arena opens up, it's time to get back at it. So I might as well spar now, you know, because it's, and, 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 and I didn't make a record just to buy myself time, but I will say that an added benefit of having, you know, released a body, a strong body of work this year has made me feel like, okay, well, the last album cycle was two and a half years. And that's just from touring opportunities. It wasn't intentional, but it's like, this is a strong album, you know, and I, I would be on tour right now. We're supposed to be in the middle of a, six week North American run right now. Wow. You know, we've had to continue pushing that back. So, um, just you play down here, right? You come yeah. The, the Orpheum. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Cool. Play, play the Orpheum. And I was just down there. We did, I think the only Florida show on the, on the last run with BT Bam and Sean was, uh, was in Orlando. Okay. Yeah. It's Florida is a hard, a hard state to tour because it's really long. It is not a tons of places. Yeah. It's hard for, it's also hard for rock and metal. I feel like you have to be really on and you have to have that fan base. Yeah. Um, I feel like some other music might do a little bit better. Huge EDM scene, huge underground hip hop scene. Yep. Yeah. Rock and metal kind of hard. Well now, especially so many arenas, so many places have closed. I mean, there's a place down the road for me called Skipper's. It's been around like 30 or 40 years. It's like Buddy Guy played there, uh, Hot Tune, all these, and it's gone. I mean, a lot in that, you know. No, it's crazy. I mean, that's, uh, and I'm sure it, everybody's heard people on the podcast talking about the depressing nature of the, I mean, we, we, we don't have to. Yeah, no, we don't have to go pretty, there. But. Pretty freaking morbid. I'm very... But I think it's going to come back because somebody else will buy that place. You yeah, know? dude, it is going to come back. It's just the landscape's going to be different. A little bit, yeah. I've, you know, I, what I talked about with Finn on the Punk Rock NBA was how the bottom tier, sort of the bottom rung of the touring microcosm or ecosystem, if you will, you know, was like bands that could do 250 to 300 cap rooms, maybe even smaller, be on tour in a van all year long, constantly staying busy. You know, somebody asks what you do. You're like, yeah, I tour. It might not be glorious. It might not be making a ton of money, but a lot of guys can stay out. Their booking agent always has them shows. Yeah. I think, you know, whereas that was the bottom rung and like, uh, you know, a band like Intervals, which is like maybe on the low, like a 400, 500 cap and, you know, we can go up to a thousand plus and we also do bigger opportunities like festival appearances and stuff we would be considered to be like a mid-tier band and then you have like the bigger you know the upper mid-tier which is like you know baseline for them is like a thousand to twelve hundred they can go as high as 25 they do the bigger festivals and then you got the big guys right i feel like the whole thing shifted down a rung to where now like we're like the mid-tier now we're the bottom because who is taking I think that for temper i think for now 
until Which, things settle in again. But yeah, the dogs got to go in there and turn the lights on when it's time to go again. Because you, totally booking agents and venues need surefire acts. They're going to pack it. Now we get the added benefit of human beings missing concerts so bad that you're going to see it's going to be gangbusters. It's going to be a renaissance again. We know that. I think so. Yeah. This is the flow of humanity. Yeah, I just, think so, man. Art and culture always have this cycle when it's suppressed or, you know, sort of uh, stifled in any way. It just bursts through the seams, you know. So I'm excited for that. But yeah, man. I think everybody is. We're ready to go. I still got a bus deposit. <laughs> there you go. Well, dude, listen, uh, you're a super bright guy. I could talk to you for a long time and you're a great musician and a good songwriter, great guitar player. Let me tell people, and thank you for being so cool and open and talking about sure. all, all these Appreciate things. It, man. Uh, the new record is circadian. Um, you can, I, I would, everybody listening, if you want to get into Aaron Marshall's music, it's Aaron Marshall. Now there's another Aaron Marshall that does uh, electronica. That's the wrong guy. It's intervals. So go to intervalsmusic.net. Huh. And you could see everything this Aaron Marshall does. Also, Aaron's pretty active on Instagram. So go to his Instagram there and follow him. It's Aaron Intervals. Uh, the new record is Circadian. It's a really good record. I like my favorite songs. There were five HTP. I'll just one, four, and five. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you names. No one's going to remember. But uh, eight, five HTP, Lock and Key, and Signal Hill were nice. my favorites. Nice. But, Thanks. but to, what's that? Bangers. Yeah, yeah. Good, real good, real good tracks. Thank and uh, man, I look forward to seeing you on tour. A anything else? Any final words of wisdom? Oh, dude, this was stellar, man. Great conversation. Really appreciate Thank you. the uh, the the platform and the ability to just have a great conversation with a great dude. And thanks, thanks. to everyone who listened and stuff. If you guys are new to the music, please hit me up on Instagram. Uh, you know, all the pertinent links are in the bio and all the places that you need to go. You can go to uh, the last one that I'll share is if you go to sheethappenspublishing.com, you can go to the their artist section and you can just, you know, click on the intervals tab. You'll also see a bunch of your favorite bands there as well. Um, there's going to be some uh, leftover, like limited physical goods from the um, pre-order campaign for the new record. A couple of vinyl variants we got physical tab books digital tab books jam track bundles that have all of my leads muted so you can play along and cover the songs at home make your own cover cool. videos so it's like i'm out of your way so you that's can a good product you know, and, and, you know and you can you can do my stuff and do whatever you can improvise over it whatever you however you feel it's there for you we've got cloth for your cold winter body we've got we made dice and masks and all kinds of stuff guitar picks everything's there sheet happens publishing.com just go to the interval section you can check it out some limited fuzzy limited. dice not fuzzy that's like actual dice that you can need some fuzzy with. dice man I'm from I'm from the Bronx. I need fuzzy dice. I don't condone gambling, but I do like it's a fun little like quarantine in your social bubble activity at home. You and mom and dad can gamble for bus change. That sounds strange, but you should just you know. I, th I, I think you should like start. You, I see like a big future for you in like some sort of like the stuff you're interested because you, you're as passionate about all that biohacking as you are music. At least that's how it reads to me, man. I, I see like, you. I see you coming back on here one day, not as a musician, but as like my guest today is Aaron Marshall. He figured out how to cure cancer in three days uh, by eating pomegranate juice or something like that. You know, pomegranates could, are good for you, though. Everyone go <laughs> pomegranates. Shout out to pomegranates, but uh, <laughs> no, that's, uh, fuck yeah, dude, that was great. I could uh, I could uh, be wasting your time, but we're we're, we're going to leave it there. Thanks to everybody for listening. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate your time as well, Craig. Thank and, you for coming yeah, on the show man for sure let's connect uh hopefully it's on tour maybe it's another one of these whatever just stay in touch and uh likewise man it's doing great enjoy your holidays everybody be safe all right we'll see everyone soon hang on one sec i'll you, you and i'll wrap up everybody thank you so much for listening if you enjoyed this please share it on your social media channels we appreciate your support thank you very much to aaron marshall uh, for everything, please go to uh, intervalsmusic.net and follow him on Instagram at Aaron Intervals. And uh, most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play a guitar, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I am out. Thank you so much, brother.